Very Good Music, a BGM podcast, is now proudly associated with RPGera.com, where you can find reviews, videos, podcasts, and more covering all your pop culture needs. Brian, the founder and CEO of RPG Era, has been featured on the show before and also hosts his own BGM podcast, BG Mania, with his friend Frank. Are you a fan of wrestling? Check out Blood and Destroyers, a podcast all about AEW. Into general gaming news and commentary? Max Level is the podcast for you. Looking to commiserate about the darker side of pop culture? Join Frank on Terrible, a horrible, no good, very bad podcast. Finally, The Media Files, hosted by Kyle, is your one-stop shop for all of your pop culture needs. Check out all of RPG Era's offerings using the link in the show notes. Now, let's listen to some very good music. Greetings, gamers. I'm Bedroth. And I'm Shoot Kapow. And I'm Brent Black, a.k.a. Brental Floss. What? And you're listening to Very Good Music. A VGM podcast. <laughs> 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 And so, yeah, this is our uh, this is our special guest. Hi! <laughs> oh my gosh! No way! <laughs> yep, that was not pre-recorded. He is here, and uh, well, not in the flesh. What a, but... what a trick that would have been <laughs> to, to, to like get me to record just that part. Oh, that would have been great. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of, this is a good time to ask: Are we a PG rated or an R rated? Uh, we are like, PG I'm... rated, so that'll be my first. Okay. Uh, I'll find a, a, a nice sound effect and bleep, and um, but that's cool. No, Perfect. no problem okay. at all. <laughs> okay, I'll try to keep those to a minimum, but you know. As long as you find some really great bleep noises, who knows? Maybe I'll just lay them on thick. Give you something to do. <laughs> there we go. And it depends on the episode a bit. Our last uh, main episode was a uh, Mick Gordon show. And some of the names are just, I mean, you got a name like Damnation, and I'm not going to bleep that. So it's, <laughs> it's, oh, so, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's in the Bible. There you go. I think that one's okay. <laughs> And, you know, come to think of it, ass is in the Bible, too. So uh, you might be covered. That's if true. That's my, if, that's, that's, if true. that's my line. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, everyone, if it is not uh, not clear yet, uh, we are joined this week by um, super, super special guest who I'm very excited to have on the show. Uh, Brent, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to, to join us. Well, it's a pleasure. Um, you know, I don't do as many guest spots as I used to, but... The more I found out about what y'all are doing, it was like, you know, this seems like it could be fun, and uh, you caught me at exactly the right time. It's Saturday, November 12th. Well, I don't know if people need to know, but let us just say my Thanksgiving vacation starts in the morning. Nice. I am fully packed. It's a good time to talk about some VGMs. There you go. And yeah, it's November 20th. We, um, I think we might have alluded to that on our last show, but I uh, appreciate the, the discretion there. And um, yeah, glad, uh, glad we caught you at a good time. I know that you have been on one VGM podcast I've heard of before, um, Game That Tune. Yes. That was a fun episode. Now, what it, what it would not have done uh, would prepare you be to prepare you for the, I guess, what has become the standard. I don't know if you're aware of this, but there are probably a good dozen video game music podcasts out there, <laughs> and um, most of them follow the format that we're going to follow tonight, where we can just kind of talk about the song, play the song, and then talk about it a little more and lead into the next one. Game that tune has got a really, really unique and fun sort of sort of spiel that they do. So this is going to be a little bit yeah. different, but. Um, I wanted to, to have you on because when when I think about VGM, you are one of the names that 
that really springs to mind because these days I'm not as much of a gamer as I used to be. I'm really more into the music itself and sort of the culture that has sprung up around this little niche of, of the, uh, of the fandom. And mm-hmm. I really, I enjoy talking to composers of which you are one. Um, you have some VGM that's been used in, in published games, but also you are, um, obviously a VGM fan and one of, I think one of the ones who really sort of brought the, like more popular awareness of video game music as music to um, a lot more people through through what you did as Brental Floss. So I guess with uh, and plus we're just uh, um, Shuka Pow and uh, Dusk, um, her little sister and myself. We're all you know big fans of yours. So it's just it's really cool to have you on. Um, but I guess with that, why don't you talk a little bit about sort of your history with. Uh, with VGM and with uh, just music in general, because I know you've got a really wide um, musical history and uh, you're involved in more musically than just video game stuff. Yeah, I'll try to do both of those at the same time. I'm a real rambler, so you are always invited to just steer me like a drunk cow. Just, okay, go over this way, big guy. Here we go. I've listened um, to a whole lot of your podcasts, so, and trust me, man, the, as much of your voice on the show as I can get, I'm good. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, careful what you wish for. Okay, so um, my history with video games, I still remember I was like three or four. My dad brought home the NES uh, that was right around the time that people were starting to get them, like, across the country in the U.S., like, mm-hmm. 87, 88. Um, and so, you know, I thought Duck Hunt was okay, but all we had was Duck Hunt and Mario Brothers, the original Super Mario Brothers, mm-hmm. I should say. Did you have them on and, that single um, cart that came with the system? Yep. 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 I remember. And, uh, that's all we had for a, a long time, but, um, you know, loved loved Mario and one of the earliest instances of what would become, you know, a major chapter in my career was me sitting there and playing a water level um, in, you know, the original Super Mario Brothers and making up a little tune to it at the age of four or five. And like, I hadn't realized my dad had snuck in and like been listening to me just singing along and I was very embarrassed, and I guess it took me, I don't know, another 20 years after that to try it again. But anyway, so I was like a <laughs> musical kid. Like, I made up lyrics, and it just like I would sing little songs and make them up as I went. Meanwhile, um, I happened to have a grandma on my mom's side and a grandpa on my dad's side who both played the piano um, in kind of a play-by-ear kind of way. And so they both just taught me little things here and there, and I just, you know... I started playing piano kind of on my own, and uh, that led to composing around the age of 12. Meanwhile, I'm playing, you know, all these different video games during what I would consider the golden age of video game music, basically late 80s through late 90s. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so um, I just ended up becoming more of a composer and a songwriter, started writing musical theater, uh, and basically... I I had I had become less of a regular gamer. By that I mean, by the time I was 24, uh, when when my first Brental Floss with lyrics video came out, I played games sometimes. Most of it was like to go back and play my old favorites. I wasn't like someone who played them all the time. Kind of always had a current one. And so the irony is that me making that one video on YouTube. That, you know, I had gotten Mega Man 3, the title theme, stuck in my head. Making lyrics for it was just like a thing that seemed funny at a time when I was trying to get attention on YouTube, trying to find a way to make people click. And um, the irony is that the success of that video and the way that it spawned a series of videos and then albums and blah, 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 (laughs) kind of like... It's it's almost like, you know, that horror trope of the hand coming out of the grave. Like, it was like, oh, no, you're still this kind of nerd, mofo. Come on down. <laughs> Come on back. All the video game tunes you remember, you are going to exploit. Um, but uh, that's one way to look at it. But also another way is just to enjoy and share with the world. But, yeah, so that's like a very brief kind of parallel history of me with VGM and also me with just M. 
Very cool. Very cool. And uh, I am, I think, just about a year or two older than you. Um, it, I listened to uh, your your show that you did for a while, Trends Like These, with Travis McElroy, and you all talked about your, your age and like when you graduated and stuff like that. And so just kind of parsing from that, um, I would have been probably mm-hmm. about six or seven in uh, 88, 89, when, when Mario really started getting big. And so, yeah, definitely all the stuff you're talking about, the, the golden age of EGM, as you put it, growing up with the NES, the SNES, and then getting into the N64. And uh, a couple of my friends had like a PlayStation and a uh, Saturn and that whole era of music and gaming. And I still... I'll have like tentpole gaming experiences where a game will come around and I'll spend just a whole bunch of time with it, like Breath of the Wild or Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition. Um, but usually mm-hmm. I just, it's, I'm kind of a one game at a time kind of guy. And these days, weeks or even a couple of months can go by and I won't pick up a controller, but then I'll just get back in and, uh, um, you know, take it from there. But. So I've done just a little bit of composing myself. I did study music for a couple of years in college, and I think all that that's given me is just a slightly slightly heightened sense of things, I guess, more than the average person. I can, I can find more things to be annoyed about than the average person can when it comes to music. <laughs> there it is. There it is. <laughs> but um, other than that, uh, you know, it's not too much. Um, actually, just our last episode was uh, some of my compositions and some of uh, Shoot's compositions. Now, Shoot has composed at this point either composed or arranged over 180 tunes over on flat.io. And so um, she awesome. is really, really into it. Uh, plays trumpet in the high school band. And I've got a little bit of piano uh, in there with shoot. And we're trying to get, uh, I'm trying to convince to either go through some, uh, like some composition on YouTube, possibly a couple of theory classes, but just a little bit to sort of undergird the, uh, the instincts that he has. Um, and I'm trying you. to convince dad to get me a saxophone. I thought you wanted a trombone. I want a saxophone and a trombone. But like <laughs> straight to careless whisper. Oh, saxophone and trombone. So you'd like to be able to do a whole ska band by yourself. That's Pretty cool. much it. Yeah. <laughs> um <laughs> honestly, I'm for it. I'm for it. And you know, it's funny like it's interesting what different people's brains will gravitate toward. Like I don't think I would trade the various things my brain gravitated toward when it comes to music, but sometimes I wish I could trade one thing in for like sight reading because mm. just sure don't sight read. I could barely read the same here, a fake book, you know, <laughs> same jazz here. chords. But at yep. the same time, I think that, you know, you get certain musculature and certain brain hand coordination and you can do things that some people who sight read can't do. So it's like, you know, it's it's interesting to see how, as you evolve as a musician, how just the way your brain works can respond differently to different aspects of it. So that'll be really interesting for you to continue to discover. For sure. For sure. And um, so you, Brent, have uh, – you mentioned that you kind of got into piano a little bit when you were young. Obviously, you sing. Do you play anything else? I play a little bit of drum set. What I really shine at with drums is MIDI. <laughs> because I've gotten so good. Like, MIDI mapping of drums is pretty universal. So I've gotten pretty good at being able to do, like, the... You know, so, like, all of my arrangements for uh, Brennel Floss and even for, like, you know, I, uh, there's a guy that I wrote a musical with about 12 years ago who now writes musicals out in California, and he does them all with tracks. So he'll pay me, you know, a little token fee to, to do drums for him now if i sat down to a drum set today i could probably do like an eight beat like out of the box extremely generic with like a ringo star kind of fill like nothing fancy but um (laughs) right there's that and i mean like you know accordion is it different enough from piano like the buttons on the left kind of are um i don't i think at a certain point mallet percussion you know it always it's all kind of on a spectrum between right yeah um, but between percussion and piano which are both in there but other than that um i mean look i learned i learned guitar chords and that taught me that i like piano better but it was an <laughs> interesting way to have um a little keyhole into how music works on on string instruments so it was good but the short answer is basically keyboard is the strong suit Mm -hmm. by a long shot and then way back there are drums and guitar okay 
Okay, cool. Well, you are um, a really talented pianist. I've uh, I've seen some of your stuff on YouTube where you would like um, sort out like a blues riff or play something like a rag, and uh, um, also just your your ear for different genres is something I really admire. I am I'm horrible about um, grouping genres in my head and like telling if something is jazz or or fusion or funk. Uh, the blind blurs for me, uh, but like your ability to hear. Uh, I think it's in one of your your Bioshock covers. You you made a, another video where you did the Bioshock song as a rag, and you talk about in the video how you, you were you were the music theater nerd, and you was very slightly annoyed that people kept calling what you did before a rag when it was more it was more something else. And so um, <clears throat> I think that that's that's really cool, and I, I'll be interested to hear some of just some of your approach to. Uh, the, the covers that you did a little bit later in the show. But first, I think, um, so when we talked about how we were going to put together this episode, there were a couple of different areas that I thought we might be able to tackle. And uh, you actually recommended, why don't we do some kind of mix of all of these things? And I thought that sounded really cool. So the show today is going to kind of be um, in three parts. We're going to start with what I guess we could call some of your influences or just some of your favorite tunes, what I would have like any of my friends on to talk about, uh, like their, their favorite BGM. And then we're going to talk a little about your um, your arrangements, and then we're going to talk some about your original work. And then at the end, I'm definitely going to give you a chance to, to plug some of your other stuff. I know that you've got a lot of things going on, and so um, always we always do that as well. But yeah, um, this first little section is going to be a few of your your favorite tunes, and I think I mentioned you could pick either just some of your favorite songs or songs by some of your favorite composers, but I think what I'd really like to get at here is um, you know, a little more of a window into some of your history with with games and VGM, but also maybe some of how some of these things influenced you if they did. Cool. Um, let's do it. All right, cool. So what is the first track that, uh, that we're going to be listening to tonight? The first one, uh, you know, I think appropriately happens to also be the first with lyrics video I did on YouTube. And that is Mega Man three, the title theme. Uh, and that is an NES game by Capcom, I believe 1990. that three has the better soundtrack but i think two is just sort of the the fan favorite <laughs> it's just tricky because like i think two has a more consistent soundtrack i think yes. three has a lumpier soundtrack but it's sort of like the difference like two is like a bowl of frosted flakes whereas three is like a bowl of uh you know like raisin brand nobody wants just the brand <laughs> but those raisins man those raisins <laughs> um, i hear you yeah, I can see that. I, I think you're right. The high points of three for me, like Snake Man and Spark Man, are my favorites from those two, uh, and they they just outshine anything to me. Pretty much anything on the two soundtrack. Of course, Wiley's theme is in another. It's on another level, but um, you know, there's some really great stuff there too. Air Man, Bubble Man, Metal Man. It's just I don't know. It's all good stuff. I know that I yeah. know that you like Bubble yeah. Man. <laughs> I do, you know, and and it's um and just yeah, just to put a bow on what we were talking about, like I, you know, I think I think it's kind of like if you look at like a series of movies, I think it's a little bit more concrete to talk about which one is better than the other. But when it comes to soundtracks, it's just such a complex thing to compare one to the mm -hmm. next, especially when there are different composers, um, and the fact that you know you can have a favorite song on a soundtrack that otherwise sucks. And you can also have a soundtrack that's very nostalgic that the music you wouldn't particularly like if you didn't have nostalgia for it. 
Um, but you know, when people are like, "Oh, two's better. Oh, three's better," it's like, you know, it's so much of that. You're right. It is so. It, it's very hard to divorce it from your experience. And uh, Shuka Pao right. is completely unambiguous as to which one is the better game, right? Shoot. Yep. And which one is it? Mega Man Two. <laughs> I tend to agree, honestly. I think, I think two is like, two is just it's like tight. The structure is it's like infinitely replayable, but it gets itself over with. And, you know, you want to play it again. Three, and again, three was my first Mega Man, and it holds a very, Mm -hmm. very uh, dear place in my heart. But three is just like, oh, and then this happens. Oh, and then we're going to bring back the bosses from the last game. But guess what? They're they're huge, and you can't jump (laughs) over them. That'll be fun. It's like, okay, well, luckily we're done with them. No, you're (laughs) not. It's like, okay. All right. Where's my game, Genie? Anyway. (laughs) But yeah, yeah. Three, 3 was my first one as well, and I think you're right. The nostalgia goggles for me make it make it really special, but I can't argue that objectively, as a game, 2, two is a much more solid experience. And I think it's prettier. I think 3, they took more mm-hmm. chances with the, the look, and they'd had, two, they'd had two games of more generic or just kind of visually pleasing kind of looks, and for 3, they were like, what if we just do some stuff that's straight up like ugly color schemes <laughs> because we're running out of color schemes but also like let's be a little great right. let's be a little edgy um i don't know if that's anywhere near the words they would have used but it was just it took more chances and i think things that take more chances um nothing ventured nothing gained but again lumpy stuff that's better than anything in Mega Man 2 and stuff that's worse than anything in Mega Man 2 in the same game well, you mentioned that this one uh, is the first track that you set lyrics to and put on YouTube. What is it about this one that you think made it special? Or is it something about just the uh, the style of the song that it just lends itself to vocals sort of being added in? Um, so there's a lot of, a lot of moving parts here. Um, as it happens, I was teaching a course that I created called Let's Make a Musical, uh, right after I graduated from NYU with a degree, basically in musical theater writing, I was teaching a course to you know eight to eighteen year olds, and so I was just steeped in lyric writing and teaching songwriting every day, five days a week, and I just got the Mega Man Three tune stuck in my head. But um, it had been stuck in my head many times before. I learned to play it probably in high school. It's a fairly complicated tune. I didn't even really understand the way the notes fit into sort of like a blues scale kind of situation. Mm -hmm. But it's just one of those songs that I consider it to be up there at least, you know, it's just, it's just really freaking good and really unique. And with that being said, it has a unique, um, what, what am I trying to say? So different melodies lend themselves to different kinds of lyrics. You really don't want in my position to do a lyric for a ballad that's slow and doesn't have many syllables unless you've got a really clear concept because you don't have that much um, you don't have that much information you can impart per uh, per second right. of time yeah. this one has this run that goes and those triplets just beg for internal rhymes so uh, Dishevel and Rebel and Devil re I'll steal their weaponry, even though that's a little bit more uh, hip-hop style rhyme than my usual, like, musical theater style rhyme, it just lent itself. So, like, and it's, you know, the whole idea of having had, and it's still sort of, you know, uh, having had a career and still essentially having a career built on, we'll say, adding lyrics to video game tunes. Uh, sometimes people really want their favorite tune from a game to be the lyric, but it won't be lyrical Mm -hmm. the way that they think it is. And you can always do a joke thing where you just add lyrics. You know, you can do that all day, but if they're not, you know what I mean? If they don't really fit, then people that don't quite understand the process will just think, I didn't like that one. I don't know why I didn't like that one. Maybe it's just bad and you're bad. It's like, well, no, (laughs) this was going to be really hard to make this one good for reasons. But, um, (laughs) but yeah, so like, I, I, I don't know. It's it, There's these little turning points in my life that I look back and go, what would happen if I hadn't just done that thing spontaneously? I started playing piano spontaneously before I even knew my grandma played. It was on my sister's two-octave toy piano. <laughs> um, 
I just started playing. I, I, I saw a trailer for the movie My Girl with Macaulay Culkin mm-hmm. and realized I'd heard the song My Girl on the oldies station a few days before, and I started trying to figure out how to play it. What would have happened if I had not done that? What would have happened if I had not very spontaneously started just recording that Mega Man thing and made a video? And it, as it happened, I had I just bought you know a nice MacBook that had iMovie built in, and an onboard mic, and I had all the tools I needed. It just happened, but it's like I have no idea what would have happened. Um, I'm not sure where that came from, but I, my point is that uh, talking about VGM and my Brennelfoss career bring up all these questions of these these little moments where it's like I don't know exactly why I tried that, but it was absolutely a giant turning point, and I had mm-hmm. no idea how big at the time. I was just manically. Uh, just throwing a thing together because it was, you know, I was done with class for the day and I had nothing else to do in a small town in Oklahoma. So there you go. Made a thing and it spawned a, a career. Had you had some success? Like, because you mentioned that when you had the little Mario song that you, you kind of put some words to it back when, you know, when we were really little kids. Had you, did you continue doing that? Like, just kind of randomly setting words to, uh, to non lyrical tunes? And had you had some success, like, with friends, or, like, did people get a kick out of this? Did you have some idea that, hey, this is something I feel like I might be pretty good at. I'm going to put it on the internet. So I, uh, off and on growing up, would, you know, do little, what I would at the time call parody uh, songs like, um, oh, there's a song by Aerosmith from the mid-90s called Pink, and I Mm -hmm. did one called Black. And it was just sort of rearranging what the song was singing about, but with things that were the color black. Or like, um, you know, I'd write little funny like, like raps, like my, you know, a rap about an old man. Like my name is Gramps, and I'm here to say. Like there was <laughs> like various things, but I don't think I ever made lyrics for a video game tune, like in, in a way that I shared with anyone, or maybe even wrote down until the YouTube thing in 20, uh, 2008. So like, yes and no. I did stuff that I thought, you know, that I wanted my friends to think was cool with music, but I didn't quite put together that I could just, you know, make funny songs about video games. Because if you think about it, it's like, there's something very self-broadcaster oriented about making a song that's for a specific audience of people that have played a specific game. That feels more like a thing that would occur to you if you're like, oh, it's 2008, and for the first time in history, I can just broadcast a thing myself to an unlimited number of people that could potentially watch it. As right. opposed to, I'm going to make a Mega Man 3 lyric and hope that I can show my friends one at a time, live, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, it, it was just a different thing. Like, it's, it, it's, it's... I hear you. There would have been no way to present it, so I think that's why the idea didn't really occur to me till till much later though i did you know like i said set lyrics to either other instrumental tunes or replace lyrics in songs that already had them gotcha okay that makes some sense and i think i remember you uh you saying on on one of your shows before you're you're a weird al fan oh yeah okay i mean more of an admirer (laughs) than like a diehard but like Mm -hmm. huge influence no question there we go yeah um, yeah, and I'm the same way. It's I a lot of what you said and the amount of thought that you go into whether this particular, not just this particular melody, but this particular style of melody, like if it's a ballad versus an upbeat pop sounding tune, what sort of lyrics would go well over that? That sort of attention to detail and this really kind of engineering of a song is something that I really sort of, I think of Al when I think of that, because I know that that's that's what he puts into his work just from the things I've read, the things I've seen. And I know that, uh, I mean, that's what makes him stand out from all of the other people who try to do what he does. I think that particular attention to detail is really what, what makes him stand out. And, uh, I feel the same way about your stuff. So, um, well, thanks. You're welcome. You're welcome. So we're going to go from a title theme now, it looks like, to an ending theme. And another one that I just, <laughs> I love this song. It's one of my favorites of your With Lyric songs. Uh, what is our, our next tune on the list? That would be, uh, now, the, the, the title of this one is up for some debate. 
It's been called Beautiful Hyrule. It's been called Legend of Zelda, Zelda A Link to the Past Ending. But specifically, which, specifically the one it is, is um, when you beat The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past, there is a quick uh, little sequence where the three Triforces talk to you. It's not that. Right mm-hmm. after that, there's this little... Um, just this little sequence montage thing of like an epilogue. Yeah. Of what it's, happens. It's like a cast once... roll type of thing. Right, right. But not a staff roll, which is interesting. Not, not a staff it's roll, like, which is, yeah. It's like, yeah, it's like a where are they now kind of thing. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, it was just a very, I think it's a very good song. I think that the thing I did with it lyrically has nothing to do with my feelings for it. <laughs> I just needed the concept because I really love it. It's really close to my heart and I remember pausing it or maybe I couldn't pause it I forget but I really wanted to show my dad the second time I beat it so like mm. I sat him down in front of it and I started singing along and say and like reading all the captions and he was like I can read it son I got it thank you <laughs> um yep but yeah it's a it's a good one all right well let's get into the uh I guess technically the ending theme or beautiful Hyrule from The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past and I'm going to be very surprised if Shuka Pao is able to <laughs> restrain himself from singing along at least a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
And that was uh, Beautiful Hyrule from The Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past, composed, of course, by Koji Kondo. And uh, so, yeah, Brent, you mentioned um, what you did with the uh, with lyrics <laughs> um, version of this song. It doesn't have much to do with the way you feel about it. Uh, and you've already talked a little about your experience with it, but what, what about this song makes it... What about this song made made you want to bring it on the show specifically? It's just one of those songs that, like, you know, when you first take a music course, like music appreciation or band or something, you know, the teacher will try to explain how music kind of reaches emotional places in us that are difficult to reach in any other way, like a back scratcher. Um of our feelings and this one has a very rare combination of like upbeat kind of a majestic happy victory feel but also this really deep running kind of uh, vein of of heart and beauty and um, it, it, it's like when you're nine and you've beaten this game that truly feels epic. Truly epic. And mm-hmm. these people you helped or talked to or saved, the game's telling you, hey, everything turned out all right. Look what you did. Everybody's great. Um, and the music's both celebratory and also... It's not melancholic. There's a word that's not quite springing to my head, but I'm dancing around it. But it, it's... Yeah. it's um, there's something emotional for lack of a better word which i, I definitely yeah, lack yeah. I, I the word melancholy popped into my head right around the time you said it and that is a little strong for what we're listening but there is a, a sort of a hint of sadness i guess a bittersweetness, bittersweetness which of course a yeah. kid feels upon having a game Finishing they were totally game addicted like this. to and yeah exactly yeah. yeah but it's beautiful and um you know of course my feelings about it are affected by the visuals but i feel like with almost any video game uh though though i will contradict this soon in our list but i feel like (laughs) with most games like we said earlier you really can't separate the fullness of the experience with the song itself yeah and this one it's it it is one of those it's interesting because i can listen to it on its own but it, it will never recreate exactly that feeling I had the first time that I uh, I beat this. And this one right. and the staff role, for that reason, are, are two of my absolute favorite pieces of video game music. They're both just so, so good. We're going to switch gears quite a bit to... Um, to another really, really, really classic track. Um, maybe... Of the first five that we're bringing here, I, I think this one is... Probably not as iconic as number four on the list, but it is it is a huge um, presence. It has a huge presence in the video game music scene. Uh, what is our what is our next track gonna be? This one is from a game called DuckTales. <laughs> our listeners may have heard of uh, Capcom Maybe. also, I think nineteen ninety along with Mega Man three, give or take. But um this is the level in the game where Scrooge McDuck goes to the moon. So it is often just referred to as DuckTales, the moon, or the moon theme. We are back. That is that was Ducktales, the Moon theme, and uh, this is just more of a casual conversation. If that hasn't become obvious now that we're uh, about forty minutes in, uh, so all of the usual stuff, uh, publisher year, system, all that stuff. If we don't mention it, it's going to be in the show notes. But yeah, why don't we just go ahead and um, get into it, Brent? 
the moon theme. What have you got to say about this one? So every other tune on my list of favorite, you know, well, the, the list I've picked today, you know, for this show, every other one I found myself attached to because I played the game in my youth. However, I played DuckTales in my youth when I rented it from Blockbuster Video. I found it annoyingly hard, and I <laughs> didn't ask to rent it again. Uh, I could not have told you what that tune was. If you had, you know what I mean? If you'd said, y you'll win a million dollars if you can <laughs> name which video game this comes from, wouldn't have been able to tell you. But as I started doing Brental Floss stuff in the summer of 2008, there were some games that people kept on saying I should do. Uh, not long after that, they were saying Cave Story. Um, they kept mm -hmm. saying DuckTales the Moon, DuckTales the Moon. And I just finally looked into it. I was on vacation uh, with my family in Florida. And so I just, you know, on with, with YouTube. Um, actually, was it YouTube? I forget how I got it onto my phone or my iPod, but the point is I was walking up and down the beach listening to this tune and it just getting more and more and more hooked on it. And little did I know that it, it's just one of those... It is to video game music enthusiasts what something like Jingle Bells or Joy to the World is to Christmas song enthusiasts. It is just like mm -hmm. a meat and potatoes tune. But, um, yeah... Uh, it's it's there's something really special about it and one thing that I always noticed that most people who cover it don't notice this is a bit of a flex but whatever um, no, go ahead usually when usually when people cover this song the intro is done in some kind of four four I was uh, hoping that you would get to this because yeah I've heard about this please continue this is really cool yeah so the intro for God knows what reason. This is Hip Tanaka, right? He wrote this one, if I'm not mistaken. Um, this one, I think, is here. Um, he's not a, a huge name. Hiroshige Tonomura, I want to say. Uh, this really? was not discovered for a long time. Um, I think until it started getting a little bit more experience. But you, you are yeah. right. It is. It is Hiroshige Tonomura. I, I'll, I'll be honest. I'm not always great with composers, which is probably disappointing to some of your listeners, but <laughs> no, I, no, I'm no, always more likely to know uh, the tune and where it comes from than necessarily the composer. But so depending on how you count it, let us just say that the intro, the measures instead of being four quarter notes are actually 15 sixteenth notes. Or you could also write it, I'm not great at notation, so, you know, somebody might correct me, but you could also do it as, uh, I think you could do it as like 4-4 four, four and then a 7-8 alternating. Mm. Um, but the point is that it doesn't go 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. It's like... And it's like hard to hear for the uninitiated... Um, or just the people that don't quite have that ear or don't quite have that background in music, but... Um That's the first thing I noticed when I was listening to it, and mm -hmm. uh, so I made sure, uh, painstakingly, to put that in uh, the version that I did for YouTube and then eventually on my first album. It's, it's a really, really interesting... Um introduction i think it was when i at one point was going to try to do a mashup of this and um rainbow road from mario kart 64 oh uh, nice because they've got they've got a similar sort of sound palette to them and i feel like it would work really well i don't i do not have the chops to do it i tried and it didn't work but i was trying to recreate it um I was going to lead in with this intro, and I was going to—I was trying to recreate it um, note for note, and it just kept eluding me. And I usually do compose with notation software, and um, I think I did eventually end up doing like uh, um, the sixteenth notes that you mentioned, and just kind mm -hmm. of having it work that way. But it's—it's it's really interesting. Um, but about the rest of the song, what is it that you? That you would think, as a uh, as a music aficionado and a, a, a composer of music yourself, what do you think it is about this that makes it so popular? Why do people love this so much? It's got it's got two very different flavors, um, verse to chorus, and they're both good. Uh, and it's also <laughs> you know it's like 
Some songs are upbeat and they don't need to have much heart. Like the song Tequila. Tequila. Mm -hmm. That song is <laughs> freaking fun. Yep. Jubilant. It's not has no heart. No heart at all. What mm -hmm. does heart mean? <laughs> well, you know it when you hear it. And this yep. song, you know, I'm sure y'all have heard the the phrase, it's kind of a meme. You hear it all the time, especially on social media. Like, bro, you did not have to go that hard. And I feel like <laughs> this level, the moon level, could have just been like some like we're in space la 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 like some kind of abstract <laughs> spacey sounding thing and nobody would have noticed it would have been fine instead it's a tune that has this wonderful jubilant but heart filled verse and then it does one of my favorite ways you can modulate um i can't quite think of the math in my head but i think basically we'll just say that if the verse were in c major it modulates so that the chorus is in like a flat major, which is wild. Ooh. Ooh. But it feels so natural when you're listening to it. It just feels, um, and and I might have the math wrong on those chords, but uh, from you know the last time I played it was probably a few years ago. But mm -hmm. um, it's just this really cool. There, there's a, there's a show called The Last Five Years. There's a song called The Shmuel Song that also does that modulation into the chorus, and uh, it's it's a it's a neat trick if you can pull it off because it sounds like you're entering another song, um, but the way that it just sort of judo flips into it, once you know where it's going, you're you're ready for it. Your ear is waiting for it. But the chorus, as opposed to this slightly more soaring, slightly more nostalgic sounding verse the chorus is just straight up like it's got a celebratory almost like uh, it's just more rocking a and and like it doesn't shy away from having chord uh chords in the progression that you wouldn't necessarily expect in that kind of song it's not just one four five and yeah. yeah it's just very special and and i say in my lyric about it this ought to be the ending credits theme <laughs> you know, sometimes the best song in a game ironically is the one you hear the least because it's the mm -hmm. ending credits or the staff roll or whatever and this to me feels like that kind of jubilant but slightly nostalgic kind of tune that for whatever reason japanese composers especially from the 80s and 90s are so freaking good at <laughs> yeah yeah i think it's telling that um that this is the only of the, the first five songs that you brought that isn't either some kind of title or ending theme, uh, or intro or ending theme. And, and you're right. It's, um, it really outshines pretty much everything else. And I mean, the other tunes on, on the soundtrack are, are good. I like the African Minds. I like the Amazon theme. Um, even the little, uh, the menu theme when, when you're selecting your level, it's all, you know, it's all solid stuff, but this is just heads and shoulders above anything else. And, it's really cool hearing somebody who actually has some of the some of the language to talk about why talk about what it is that makes this song special. So can I just I know that I'm going too long, but it just occurred to me. No, that's OK. Go ahead. That it just occurred to me that I attempted like a year or two ago to see if I could add lyrics to African minds because I've now done the moon and the Amazon mm -hmm. and I'm and I just found this. I just found this lyric sheet, and I just have to share with you. Please, um, please do. This is this is awesome. <laughs> Shukapa, we're um, about to have a, a a VGM VGM exclusive of some unreleased Brental Floss lyrics. <laughs> okay, so Ooh. so the thing is that there are two versions of this song nice. that I like. One is the original, which has very strange syncopated rhythms that almost feel like a mistake, and then you have <laughs> the version covered by. The One Ups, which is, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with their amazing yes. video yep. game music cover band. So I prefer the way they do it rhythmically. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of this, but wow, I really kind of went through a lot of this, but uh, here's what I've written down. Uh, one, two, three, and you're going to get gravel inside of your underpants. Boo -doom -doom -doom. I'm telling you, suddenly you'll be all about that sand pants dance. Oh, you're a duck in overdrive. I don't know if you'll even make it out alive. All your friends are hoping you'll survive. Wait, where did you go? Hey, Scrooge, you're down in the mines, man. But that time I told you not to go, not to go. For the record, I told you so. Man, I get a little bit of little sense in your head. Come on, baby, baby. Okay, well, it fell apart. But the point is that uh, I wrote that. No <laughs> one's ever heard it. But you now have. 
Wow. That was nice. Oh, man. <laughs> I've got the biggest smile on my face. Thank you so much for that. And I'll put a little bit of a put a little bit of one ups um, under that and uh, we'll we'll have a little special feature here. No, that's really cool. Cool. Yeah. I love I love little tongue twisters that become a really difficult crossword puzzle to figure out how the heck you're going to put syllables in there. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that was originally going to be for my Brennell Foss season 12, which I just did a new season of videos about a year ago, facetiously called season 12 because there were no seasons <laughs> 9 through 11. But right. um, I got burnt out pretty quick on that. But I think that could definitely be a fun lyric if I do a season, whatever, 14, 16, whatever. <laughs> Yeah, everybody go check out season 12. There's some some really really good good stuff and um, when well when we talk about some of your arrangements a little later I'll come back to it. But there was one at one point there was a little bit of disconnect when uh, Brent and I were talking and um, we both thought we were bringing arrangements and I was going to bring the one specifically for um, I think it might have been the Mega Man 3 ending theme that you did for oh. season 12. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, really, really enjoyed that arrangement, so. Thanks. I will say, I, as much as I want to take credit for it, that was a one of my rare collaborative arrangements with Speak of the Devil, Mustin. Mustin, right? Yeah. From the one-ups, yeah. Yeah, I was intimidated by the, by, I, I had tried to do Mega Man 3 ending credits, or, or staff roll, whatever you want to call it. I tried to do it as an arrangement before, but I just did not understand the chords. And Mustin is a funk, fusion, jazz kind of chord guy. He understands that language much better than me. So he basically gave me a head start. But uh, I'd like to take credit for all that. But no, we definitely collabed on that in a way that I rarely do. Yeah, I saw. I noticed I was... um I actually went through in, and I, now I'm the one rambling, but in the research for the episode, uh, look, I looked through a lot of your um, videos just to kind of get a feel for for things, and I noticed on a lot of the, on on, on most of the with lyric or without lyrics, <laughs> the arrangements um, that it was just you. But I did see a few where um, you collaborated, and uh, production I see that you've worked quite a bit with DJ Cutman on um, on some of that. So yeah, and usually usually Chris is um, sort of like. I do a mix. He does. A, he tweaks the mix and then masters. But sometimes he mm-hmm. provides beats. Um, I live now in the same town Chris, aka DJ Cutman, lives. So yeah, he and I, he's definitely put everything from being a producer of my third album all the way to putting some spit shine on tunes. Uh, let me borrow some beats. All kinds of stuff. Good dude. Very good dude. Yeah. Well, definitely don't. I don't begrudge taking a couple minutes to mention some other really cool BGM related people. So, but uh, yeah, let's go ahead and get into another classic, classic tune. Um, why don't you lead into this next one for us, Brent? Okay, so this is the what is sometimes called the Final Fantasy main theme. I like calling it the prologue theme because so often it is played when you see, you know, in the classic Final Fantasy games, they sort of do a scroll of text, not entirely unlike Star Wars. Um, interesting that they ended up making Final Fantasy IV a very Star Warsy kind of thing, but anyway. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, um, it's just very, very, very good and would be at home on the shelf with... I think tons of classical regal kind of, you know, marches um, throughout throughout the history of music. So, yeah, this is the Final Fantasy. We'll call it for our purposes here the main theme.
So you said you prefer to call this the um, the prologue theme, yeah, because that's yeah. how it's so often used. Prologue theme from Final Fantasy IV. Yeah. Okay. Prologue theme. Uh, I've I remember reading about or not reading. Uh, it was in the which one was it? You've mentioned it before, but also I think in the SNES classic with lyrics, um, you talked about uh, how Final Fantasy IV should have been <laughs> in the collection. Um, so far, it, Final Fantasy IV is also Shoot's favorite. So, um, uh, actually, I know you played through almost played through the whole thing once before. Shoot, have you um, have you started playing through it again recently? Uh, Final Fantasy IV. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm actually like almost done with it already. Okay. And which version are you playing? There's so many now. Um, I think it's just the original, like, like localization. It has, it looks, it looks like SNES. I mean, no, it. I think it's SNES. So the one that was, the one that was released in the in in 1990, I think, one in the United I, States I, on the SNES. That yeah, one. Yeah, I think so. And gotcha. it has awful cool, translation. Cool. <laughs> yeah, it took me a while. That was the game when I sort of realized, wait, uh, they can be wrong in a video game? Like, <laughs> which is silly because I should have noticed with, like, you know, congratulation, that kind of stuff earlier in life. But that's the one where it was like, you. it's like, yeah, you dare. What is it? What is, oh, the king says, disobeying me? And Cecil's like, no, I don't. It's like, what? <laughs> what? No. What? Oh, my gosh. I remember that. Anyway. <laughs> Good game. <laughs> yep. Well, this is a uh, this is a really great one. A couple of episodes ago, we did a. Um, it's a. It was character themes from Final Fantasy, specifically character themes composed by Uematsu, and um, we played a couple from from this one. It's it's got a really really cool soundtrack. And I remember looking at some in some of the wikis, we uh, saw that the names Biggs and Wedge were uh, were mentioned here, and actually apparently recurred in the Final Fantasy series. And so you um, you talked about some connections to Star Wars here, but um, you know. Uh, I'm, I've been rambling, and it's you're the one who brought this. Talk about this theme. Why do you, why do you want to talk? Why did you want to? I'm, I bet my words are running away with me. <laughs> well, I'll interrupt you by saying this. Vixen Wedge or Biggs and Wedge were also uh, cameos in Chrono Trigger at the Millennial Fair. One of the yeah, spooky and one of the tents tent through the soldiers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, so this tune, it's you know what can I say? It's very good. It's uh, it's it's. Not quite as celebratory uh, or jubilant as some of the other ones on on this list, but it is. It just feels like you listen to it and you feel like I am a king. I am Richard the Lionheart. This music is about true nobility, sacrifice, true goodness in the heart. You know the warriors of light. Um, and also, <laughs> one thing I like about it is that. I mean, it's funny. I think it's fair to say that the songs I gravitated toward growing up were the ones with what I would call a lyrical melody. Um, and even though I wasn't writing lyrics for them. And this one, you know, I'm really proud to this day of the lyric I wrote for this one because it has very tight rhymes that you don't necessarily notice. But for instance, um, uh, oh God, how does it even start? Once again, the once again, the world might fall prey to an ancient evil once again we're hurled into darkness and great upheaval so you've got world hurled evil upheaval and the fact is that the phrasing the parallel musical phrases of the song allow for that it's kind of like what we were saying with Mega Man 3 it calls for an internal rhyme and you can either answer the call or write a slightly less I don't know um, let us say disciplined lyric um, <laughs> or whatever but um it's beautiful and i think it is in part because it's very lyrical but yeah it just it it's got such uh it's just got such why am i i think i should have just sat there with a thesaurus before recording this episode because there's <laughs> just no, and i'm sure the japanese have eight words for it and the germans have 14 words for it but it's just a very specific kind of it's a sadness um, that is actually not about uh, anything melancholic. And I wouldn't even say bittersweet. It's like, it's like, you know, there's some word that means nostalgia for a place you've never been. 
Um, it's like yeah. that kind of thing. It's this abstract yeah. longing that it finds within you. For what? You don't know. They don't know. But they found it. That's what it is. And it's all up in this song. That word is now on the tip of my tongue. And I'm, I I see that it is. it literally translates to far sickness. The German word is Fernwe. Fernwe, yeah. Yeah. See, there's a kind of like a yearning. Um, I, I, that that word occurred to me. But yeah, there's. I, rem, I actually recently think I read an article about this where it talked about some of these um, these borrowed words that. And anyway, yeah. But you're you're right. You're right about about the feeling that we're talking about without the word we know to talk about it. Yeah. Um, and I also, again, just really I enjoy hearing you talk about how the the melody and the structure of the musical structure of the song lends itself to a certain lyrical structure for anybody who is interested in that kind of thing um brent also has a sort of sub series on brental floss on youtube called lyrics 101 that is really interesting for for folks who are who are kind of nerdy that way once upon a time i did some uh, some high school english teaching and I was the the nerd who was famous for really, really getting super psyched about poetry and breaking things down like um, like how Poe used the sounds of words to lend themselves to a, a sort of musicality. Uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, the same thing in The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, how um, the very the, – the consonant choices he used – echoed what was going on and actually served as kind of sound effects for the sounds of the waves and things like that stuff like that and also internal rhyme scheme i taught um um, american pie actually when i was teaching about rhyme scheme to show like complicated yeah complicated um internal rhyme and things like that and uh so i'm really into that stuff and so like what you do is exactly in sort of my music and poetic wheelhouse and so i think that's why i resonate so much with this stuff but um it's also the reason that we keep rambling so much because we could just talk about this all night it sounds like (laughs) yeah yeah but why don't we go ahead and uh end out this uh this portion of the show with um with your last of these uh of the songs by other people that we're going to be playing (laughs) yeah so this is the ending theme which ends up being sort of a combination of of what the zelda one the link to the past one uh, is as well as a regular staff role but it is the Mm -hmm. ending we'll say from super mario world Thank you. 
All right, that was the ending theme from Super Mario World, once again by Koji Kondo. And um, a little bit of an Easter egg. One of the names that you mention in your With Lyrics version of this is Bun Bun, which is the pen name of Yasuaki Fujita, who composed the Mega Man 3 title theme. Yes, so yes. We've come full circle on that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's it. All right. Well, talk about this one. This this to me sounds like it could be like a musical theater number to um well, and honestly. that's it's and just... that's i think what attracted me to it and you know like musical theater is kind of the i would say the vertex of all the different things i do musically because i can emulate certain styles uh lyrically and musically but i think that it never goes too far away from a musical theater version of that thing and so this song has a lot of things that feel like uh, you know, like a big number, maybe a finale. In a musical, it swings, it has key changes, uh, it goes into, I believe it goes into, uh, if not a stride, the way that it uses uh, a, you know, slowing a, a retard, which is what we say in the music world. You've never heard that. Yes. Uh, keep your Snickers to yourself. But anyway, um, <laughs> yes. it, it uses tempo changes, but also it does the most absolute pure show tune thing you can do, which is going from ya da 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 with swing and all around, and then it goes <laughs> ba 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 ya da 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 Straight eight, <laughs> and it's just it's so so corny it is a corn <laughs> field but I always loved it and and it is in this sort specific class of Brennel Floss lyrics where I just wanted to do this tune and I didn't care as much what it was about but mm-hmm. when I figured out a way to make it about ending credits themes for, you know, and the thing is, I actually think, okay, first off, let me say the ending credits theme with lyrics, or I guess classic, classic ending credits with lyrics um, is one of the m- unfortunately uh, numerous lyrics from my early days where I thought I was being edgy and it was 2011. Uh, and that's in the rear view you know we've we've been through some presidents we've been through some movements we've been through some things y'all and i you know some people like some people i guess got through all that without changing their viewpoints but i now will tell people like prepare to cringe at least in part yeah i mean some of us have become a little more aware of the way that uh, the things that we say can maybe resonate more in a negative way with other people yeah. who are already yeah. and, dealing with a lot of crap and they don't need this added on. So yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I feel you. Um, and the concept of that one, really it's kind of an unfair concept. Like to say, Oh, you don't get anything for winning. All you get is like a, uh, a weird crappy staff role and maybe a crappy little, you know, ending sequence. And it's like, I don't actually believe that that was bad. Mm-hmm. That's all we had, and boy, did we <laughs> appreciate it! And t- took a Polaroid, if we could, of the ending screen to show our friends, you know. But it's like I just wanted to do this tune in a way that was satirical and funny and waka waka, and very often lyrical. That's it. <laughs> That's it. It's and it's yet yet again. It's a lyrical. It just there. It feels like there must be words. Um, this is going to mm-hmm. sound a little pretentious, but but I sometimes. Uh, feel like is it michelangelo or is it just some unattributed artist this concept that there was an artist long ago who felt like uh the art is already the sculpture is already in the stone it's the artist's job to carve it out but it's in there yeah yeah i I think and at least um apocryphally i think it's attributed to michelangelo yeah And, and sometimes stephen king says the same way about finding stories yeah and for me um Sometimes there's a song that is so obviously a, a, there's a tune I should say that is so obviously sung with words. They're in there. You have to find them. Now, could I have done a totally different thing and a to- totally different concept or just done Super Mario World with lyrics with it? Sure. But something about it felt like this jokey, kind of satirical, kind of mean-spirited but like ultimately in all in good fun kind of way. And, um, but yeah, amazing song. And the fact that I I don't, I don't know why 
but it goes from dun 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 ba dun ba dun, and then like it it does this alternate version of the melody. I don't even know how to describe it, but it's almost just <laughs> saying like yeah da da da. Who even cares? We're still doing this. Yeah, da, da. and it's like why why are you doing that version? But it's so good. I don't know how you thought of it or why you did it, but it's like. It's just something so sloppy and and waka waka about it. It's corny, and yet there's something a little knowing and a little winking at you about it. It's really interesting. Uh, the composers that we played so far, as far as I know, none of them had any really formal musical training. Around this time, I think the only two who I can think of who did have that sort of background were Yoko Shimomura and. Um, Koichi Sugiyama, uh, Dragon mm-hmm. Quest guy, and um, but Uematsu and Kondo, they both really liked uh, popular music, but they didn't have any formal musical training, and so a lot of this was just instinct. And I think that when you're running on that, a lot of times you will go to places like in the Moon Theme, you will go to places that are maybe kind of unexpected because th- that's what the moment calls for. And I think that the that sort of, I guess, Wild West mentality of nobody had been doing this up until this point. Uh, Koji Kondo especially was breaking new ground, and he had sort of the freedom to do kind of weird, funny stuff like that. That just It, it fits Mario, because Mario is nothing if not <laughs> randomly goofy and funny in ways that just... <laughs> It, when you really sit and think about what's going on in a Mario game, it's just, it's, um, it's bad oh! is what it is. It's crazy <laughs> with all the mushrooms and the fire, fire flowers and the shy ghosts. <laughs> and yeah, it's just funny stuff. But okay. So we've, I think we've gotten a really good taste of, of your influences here and we're not leaving a lot of these video game worlds. I'm, I'm looking at the next three songs on the list and, uh, one of them actually is one that I think Shukapau would definitely have picked. Um, but we've got a little bit more, uh, Final Fantasy coming up next. And I'm glad you picked this one. I really, really like this remix. And this is, if I understand, if I remember correctly, this is actually not a without lyrics. This is just a straight remix that you did of, of this theme. Yeah. Is that right? I wanted to do a, I, I wanted to do a mix of, of, um, things that were originally used to accompany my with lyrics videos, as well as just arrangements of the, um, uh, of tunes that I liked because you know mm. when you when when you do it with lyrics video when one does I suppose as we all do you know as my we point all do is at that um, point, yeah. <laughs> yes yes a rite of passage um but you know what you're doing is an arrangement that is meant to accompany the voice so when I do without lyrics sometimes it sounds like a karaoke track and sometimes I slap together a melody line that was either buried in the mix before or wasn't even in there um, whereas this one, uh, which is the main theme from Final Fantasy IV, uh, I did this just sort of as a one-off, um, and it is basically, you know, it's called the New Orleans remix, um, I basically did it after listening to the Dirty Dozen Brass Band, I'm not sure mm-hmm. if it's actually fair to in retrospect to call it New Orleans, because New Orleans means a lot of things musically, Mm -hmm. But the idea was like a New Orleans brass band, something in the neighborhood of Dixie, Dixieland jazz, but not quite. Um, But yeah, this is a this is one that I uh, was proud of at the time. It was a bit of a showcase of my virtual instruments that I had, Uh, you know, just like playing around with making a trombone uh, melody that sounded a little bit more real than what I could have done before that and and baritone sack stuff like that but anyway i'll stop rambling here it is final fantasy 4 new orleans remix
The drums in this arrangement are really impressive. Thanks. I like this percussion. Shoot's getting a good ear for percussion, too. I was actually... I never did... I'm sorry, I was listening to the <laughs> listening to that trumpet at the end. Um, I, I never did a drum set really um, super well. I was, I, I can I can fill around with it, but I, I played drums in band from sixth grade all the way through my second year of college um, and actually mostly played mallet percussion, which... So I can for, sort of fart around on a piano because of that. But um, I, I did gain an appreciation for the, the construction of, you know, of percussion lines. And um, Kyler's got a really good sort of instinctual uh, he's also in band so i know that he you know picks that up um he's got a good ear for that kind of thing so um mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't even begin to know like <laughs> in any kind of music software how to make a trumpet sound like you get this one to sound at the end with that high squealing sort of closeouts that maynard ferguson-esque thing going on well you know you know um it took me a while to figure it out and there's actually a, a, a song on this playlist from before i i knew what i'm about to share with you um but basically, you know when you play basically any golf game, there's like the angle at which you want the ball to go, there's the amount of power, and then there's also whether you are accurate in hitting the amount of power you want, and then there's also wind, and then there's also like, there's all these variables, right? There's wind and there's like terrain. That's basically what you have to deal with in a golf game. Well, mm -hmm. a digital, like a virtual instrument, particularly wind, if you're not using a, a breath controller, um, which I don't, by that I mean you can actually buy, as you probably know, a digital clarinet, for instance, that isn't a wind instrument the way that, like, it doesn't play clarinet noises out of itself. But when you hook it into your DAW, your audio software, you can use it to capture your performance as if you were playing a real clarinet. I don't do mm -hmm. that because I don't play wind instruments. Instead, <laughs> I can control, once I you know put the music into the piano roll, once I record a, a pass on my keyboard, I can change the uh, intensity, meaning how much, how much the breath power was, how much air they were pushing into it. The modulation, were they shaking, were they vibrating, uh, they're doing vibrato. Uh, okay. Um, there's, there's expression, there's things like um, finishes, for instance, if I'm playing the trombone, I can just go or I can go or you know, like that kind of stuff. <laughs> and so it's all these different variables that the more you play with them, the more you realize, especially with these really high end kind of virtual instruments where they just, you know, they're made to adapt to what you're doing and they've captured almost every sound the instrument can make. Um, the more variables you explore, the more things you can make it do. Um, and once you fool somebody who plays that instrument, even once, it's like a badge of honor. <laughs> and I have had yeah, somebody go, who'd you get to play the trombone? And it was like, ha, 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 oh, I can wow. die happy. That's so um, cool. <laughs> yeah. But you, I hope you're taking uh, taking some mental notes here. Um, Brent, do you have any uh, any formal training in like electronic music production? Or is this all stuff you sort of picked up as you as you sort of grew up with the software, I guess? From, um, from college on? Uh, certainly no training in digital creation of music. I just happen to have... I really have to thank Yamaha for their um, their progression of keyboards that were made for just like, you know, the consumer level keyboards, particularly in the PSR series because they had a lot of good built-in sounds. They were cheap. Um they also had a bunch of like built-in rhythms where you could turn on, for instance, like bossa nova. And then the bottom octave of the keyboard, if you put in a chord like C minor, well, it'll play that bossa nova in C minor. You change to F, Ooh. now you've got bossa nova in F. Um, and you could even, uh, you know, as I kept getting slightly better Yamaha PSRs, you could even do like, okay, we've got bossa nova one then we've got bossa nova two for when like the song kind of heats up then we got bossa nova three same tempo but it's like if you want it to build you can also have you can push a button that makes it drum fill into the next measure and so having keyboards that had like a hundred of those Roomba bossa nova Viennese waltz eight beat 16 beat country swing after a while you start to hear what's different about all those things 
And I don't know if there had been many other ways for me to learn that. Um, so that'll be something to talk about perhaps later on with, um, well, I mean, we, you know, honestly, that's what we've been talking about. The idea of emulating styles, um, yeah, in a way that's not about arranging on sheet music. It's about knowing what the flavor is. So to this day, I can listen to a song and go, oh, here's what's giving a song that kind of flavor. Like if you ask me to taste like, I don't know, to taste a food item and say, what are the ingredients of this? Some chefs could be like, okay, I'm getting coriander, I'm getting ginger, I'm getting raspberry, I'm getting acid, salt, fat, heat. I'd be like, mm-hmm. ah, s- sugar? Like, I don't know. But <laughs> when, it comes to, when it comes to music, I can typically tell you what's giving a certain style the flavor it has and emulate those cliches or tropes or whatever to create something that sounds authentically like it or at least fools the average layman. Yeah, but uh, that's, but to, to, to answer so your question, cool. the the digital arrangement was all just a slow progression. As the keyboards I kept buying continued to have more and more options for recording, you know, my the first one that I could record on had four tracks. Then I got one with sixteen tracks, um, and I wrote a whole musical on that one. Uh, I was just very lucky to be exposed to these keyboards that nowadays. People, they would just seem so quaint and so difficult to maneuver their little crappy OS on their digital LCD <laughs> screen. But that's all I had, and I got pretty good at it. Um, and, you know, I, I think it was. I think training might have actually not been a good thing because it was. It was like a journey of discovery that took however long it needed to. But the rewards were not your parents being happy or a recital. The rewards were, Dad, I made a Roomba, not <laughs> the vacuum, the the dance, you know that kind of thing. That's really cool. Well, then shoot, I won't, uh, I won't get you, uh, I won't get you classes. You can, you can teach yourself. <laughs> not that classes aren't good, but no, no, no. Uh, you know, sometimes the <laughs> I, thing, I sometimes you. the thing you learn yourself <laughs> sticks in a different way. Yeah, nice to have um, like a springboard, but then you really gotta. I think to to be successful in this sort of area, it, it it feels like you have to kind of put in put in the hours yourself and find what it is that's going to drive you to keep doing what you want to do. Because if if you're not the one ultimately sort of propelling yourself into this for some reason, that eventually it's gonna it's gonna burn out. It's gonna fizzle out. So yeah, the best you can become if you don't care about the thing, the best you can become is a machine that does it. But you won't be a mm-hmm. machine that loves it. And that's one thing I tell people that want to put their kids in piano lessons. It's like, that's fine. And that'll really help them no matter if they play, you know, like it's good for the brain. But piano lessons at best can make you on their own can make you a good machine for playing piano, which is not the same as an improviser, composer, music theorist, whatever. Mm -hmm. Principle applies across the board, I think. Yeah, you're not going to put an AI and attach it to a player piano or whatever and have, you know, have something come out that's going to have the same heart. You know, we're coming back to that that idea of heart that that you mentioned before. I'm listening back to this. uh, And this is a really, really cool remix. Shukapow, did you um, did you dig this uh, this horn filled remix? Yep. You feel like you want to get that trumpet part and try to play it yourself? Uh, maybe <laughs> he's uh he's getting up there um this year in uh, in band uh, during a couple of the performances the um the section leader was out I think I'm telling the story right shoot correct me if I'm wrong and so in the marching um, in the marching contest t- talk about the high C a little bit yeah so we've got this guy in the band named Keegan he is a senior trumpet player and in the show he would always like. In the, at the end of the first act, he'd go up to a high C. Wow. And that that one there was this one this one game that he was I can I can hear myself. On, yeah, it's a little on, weird because we're both talking a little loud. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, one night he was out, and so I had the job of hitting the high C, and I hit it spectacularly, <laughs> like. <laughs> Wow, it's gotta that's be awesome. the proudest moment of my like band career. <laughs> yeah, and here's to it's... here's to many more. You can't see me lifting my drink, but here's to many more. <laughs> 
Cheers. I'll drink to that too. <laughs> I, but yeah, listening back to it, this reminds me of of something else. One of your other with lyrics videos. Oh, well, well, I think it's the Donkey Kong one with uh, uh with, Donkey with Kong the brass Country and everything. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. Definitely a Country. similar vein. <laughs> that's but. one of my. That's honestly among my favorite with lyrics videos, and and in large part, it's because of the arrangement and just the fun I was able to have. Uh, you know, bring, bringing that very dear to my heart song to life in that way. Another one that sounded like you had a lot of fun with was Cave Story. Oh yeah, I worked on Cave that Story with a lyrics. Long time, <laughs> so fun, so fun. Everything, just great. the delivery, the the rhyme. Um, that one's a really, really good one. I definitely encourage people to check it out. If if anybody listening is uh, has yet to experience the um, the what if video game music had lyrics line that Brent did, definitely go back and um, we'll uh, if you if you want a good starting place. One of the things that sort of brought me and Brent together is on Twitter. I just decided on a whim to list my um, my 11, because I couldn't narrow it down, my 11 favorite Brental Floss with lyrics videos. And um, and it was fun going back through and exploring some of that. So maybe a good jumping off point for anybody who wants to explore that. And uh, for the record, there are now 88 videos on the playlist called Video Games with Lyrics. Um, there's a few that aren't. Like there's one where I do the MacGyver TV theme song with lyrics, but you know, I think that if, if if anybody out there is interested, if you find the video games with lyrics playlist on YouTube, if you want to get into it, another one one way is just to kind of scroll through till you see a game that you're mm-hmm. familiar with. Um, but do know that as you get back in time, especially starting around 2014 and back, you know, the farther back you go, the more there's just cringy stuff that was more acceptable at the time that I definitely would not write today. But keep that in mind and. Maybe you'll find some remixes. Well, and like. I think to this day, if you search um, Brental Floss, one of, one of the big, big videos, the one that really, I think, put you on the map is the Tetris with lyrics, which the, the whole premise of which is that Tetris is a game for girls. <laughs> so, um, yeah. 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 And, and, it, and it is its wording is fairly condescending, even within that comparatively harmless premise. And, you know, that was my big yep. break. Uh, when YouTube front page that video, my subscribers tripled in one day. And to this day, I've never gotten that many views uh, in a single day on YouTube. It was like 660,000 in a, in a 24-hour period. Went from 3,000 to 12,000 subs. And uh, and it, it's an irony that that's one that sticks out as like, sometimes I'll see people on Twitter with their conversation. Somebody will mention me and they'll go, oh, the guy that did the sexist <laughs> sultra song? And I'll specifically... <laughs> I'll specifically at them like, hey, you know what? That is a correct way mm. to describe that. Um, I've changed a lot in the last 13 years. I recognize that's not cool. I've put a content warning. And just so you personally know, like, I'm really not that yeah. person. Um, I hope you'll give me another chance. And and every time they will be like, oh, okay, cool. Because we've all changed. Yeah. But it sucks that even though that song is catchy, a lot of people, that's what they remember. That's what they know of me and my whole self. <laughs> well, I'm sure that my voice is going to be in a lot more uh, new ears when uh, I put your name on this video than than people that listen to me will be coming to you for the first time. That was a very awkwardly worded statement, but I think everybody knows what I meant. Um, but I got it. I <laughs> but for anyone who is eventually. hearing Brent for the first time, uh, yeah, the, the the cool, funny, decent guy that he sounds like on this episode. That's that's the Brent that I have come to know through the media I listen to. So. <laughs> Um, as long as the <laughs> illusion keeps working. <laughs> there you go. Anyway, but we're um, coming up on the track that I think that Chukapau would have picked if he were going to pick one of the uh, the without lyrics remixes. Um, I'm going to do something a little different. Shoot, talk a little about why you you mentioned to me earlier that you really like the Mario Sunshine without lyrics um, tune. Um, it's. It's, you know, it's a cool arrangement, basically, and the rest of it's nostalgia. This game, well, I'll actually get Yukapa to talk some after this round, because this game really means a lot to him. I love the intro to this. Everybody will hear it in a second, but the what you do with the, the whistle sound effects is just 
it, it's so funny. And um, even with the the sort of cringy Miyamoto moment in this uh, with lyrics track, um, it, it's a really really great with lyrics video. The way that you you throw everything together and throw a little bit of funny shade at sunshine. Thanks. It's it's one of it's one of my favorites, and it's a it's a shame I didn't really think through the Miyamoto part. For those who don't know, I I basically did what I thought was a pretty good impression of Miyamoto without realizing um, a white American doing an, the impression of a Japanese person <laughs> whose English isn't mm-hmm. letter perfect uh, is dehumanizing and uh, not a good look. But, but in any case, it's still one of my when I when I put that out of my mind, it's also one of well, my favorite. Of the with lyrics, videos. and what's funny is that, uh, that you actually allude to it at the beginning of the with lyrics video. In an earlier video, you had jokingly mentioned that Sunshine was the best Mario game, and then you actually played it. Oh yeah, and then you you wrote this. So, <laughs> but all right. So without uh, further ado, this is Mario Sunshine without lyrics, Delfino Plaza remix. Um, originally, I think this one is Koji Kondo. I'm going to double check myself, but of course, arranged by our special guest, Brent Black. Super Mario Sunshine! Woohoo! Xylophone. <laughs> Love me some xylophone. Oh, yeah. Again, musical theater. Yep. Shukapau's a big fan of marimba, which was my instrument of choice when I was in band, too. I played my I played me a little bit of marimba when I was I was a percussionist in, in junior high and high school band. So. Oh, cool. Cool, cool. I definitely got down with the marimba in my day. Did you ever uh, get up to the four mallet playing? No, I, I mean, I just, I wasn't as interested in chromatic stuff. And in, in, you know, in retrospect, I wish I had been because I still to this day have a very hard time looking at a piece of music and telling you, sheet music that is, and telling you how it goes uh, mm. without having heard yeah. it and with, certainly without the chords. Um, it's it's, it's uh, just not, not part of my skill set, but did a little bit of that. Mostly just just uh, non chromatic drumming though. Gotcha. Cool. Cool. Yep. I um when I got into college, I finally got into the four mallet playing with a little um just a little tune called Yellow After the Rain, which I think was like the the common first four mallet piece, and I still remember that song because of how much I practiced it. I. I'm, I'm not super great at coordination, which is why I'm not a great drummer, um, but I was really good. I also can't sight read for anything, like you mentioned. Um, I can I can kind of do it a little bit, like if, I, if I'm 
singing and I'm having to follow notes or harmonize and I can do it decently, but I'm really good at, uh, I can look at a piece typically and kind of see how it goes, say how it goes. And so, um, I, I could look at a piece when everybody else, when we did our sight reading competitions, when everybody else was, uh, kind of getting all their instruments warmed up and everything, I would just pour over the piece I was about to play and play it out with my just my fingers where nobody else could hear it on the, mm-hmm. the xylophone or whatever I was playing and I would have it memorized by the time we actually started playing it. <laughs> That's how I kind of faked my way through nice. it. Nice. But if I ever had to sight read anything live, I live I uh, no. <laughs> it's yeah. not my thing. So <laughs> <laughs> All right. And we're back from that uh that really, really fun uh, little tune. Mario Sunshine without lyrics. Brent, what do you want to uh, talk about with this since we did all the talking beforehand? <laughs> well, you know, Mario Sunshine was one of those games that I just, I, I had no interest in it when it came out. Uh, I had, I skipped the GameCube generation because I had, I, I took a detour to become a PC gamer. Um, and it just didn't look, it didn't look as good. Uh, for some reason, it just, I was just like, what is this? This is like, this doesn't feel like a Mario game. So I never really played it. Um, when I did mention it in another video, the Super Mario Land video that I did with Dave Bulmer, um, that was just purely for the narrative. It was purely for the fact that he and I disagreed so much and he couldn't mm-hmm. believe I would like Mario Sunshine. So, like, when he and I wrote that, I think he wrote that line for me and I just gladly uh, recited it. But I hadn't at mm-hmm. that point actually played Mario Sunshine. I'd just seen a little bit of it here and there. Um, and... You know, the thing is, like, the Delfino Plaza tune is, I mean, very, very good. Very catchy. Very evocative. Um, but and that is Koji Kondo. I double-checked. So Nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> so, so um, but, you know, really what I want to share about this arrangement is that it's just full of little Easter eggs. There's a show that I think is now available on Disney Plus called Dinosaurs from the mid-90s. And... Uh, the theme song of it has this part that goes dun 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 ba da da dun 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 ba da da, and I don't know what possessed me, but when you see <laughs> the cops, like the weird Islander cops, marching mm-hmm. toward the screen in my video, where it's like you know, then we get mean, and like suddenly these the cops that arrest Mario are like marching toward the camera. It just mm-hmm. felt like dum 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 ba da da. So when you hear that, <laughs> that is a lifted. Uh, measure or two of the dinosaurs theme song, a show with animatronic dinosaurs uh, from the mid nineties. So cool. And also, um, uh, now, okay, this is a little bit delicate, but we're talking Easter eggs, and this might give you some insight into how my brain works. But there's like an offensive, like bit of music that you find throughout American culture, from basically the beginnings of recorded music to not too long ago where basically any Asian person nobody ever really cared to know uh, or or, or that theme might uh, inspire this cliche trope that's like is that even authentically any Asian culture? I have no idea. But for better or worse and like mostly worse I did put that into the bridge section where Miyamoto is singing. So it's like, but you can hear, now, listen, kids, if you're going to write comedy music, pretend you're writing it for 10 years in the future. Anything that seems halfway edgy, just think about what you're doing, because you might be hurting somebody's feelings or setting yourself up to be a cringe monster a mere decade later. But um, what else? Uh, oh, and I just like the, um, you know, there's one part in w- where there's a transition and it goes bum 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 ba dun da dun dun and like of course that's the original Mario theme. There's all these little Easter eggs in this one. It's breakneck, it's fast, there's cool xylophone stuff, there's cool piano stuff. It just I think is my arrangement style at its most fun. Cause it's just throwing things at you. Mm-hmm. Maybe you see them, maybe you hear them, maybe you don't. And it's on top of a song that had lyrics. There's just so many things you're being barraged with that what I hope is that for some people, the second, the third, the tenth time hearing it, they go, oh, I know that. I know that thing. That's my hope. All right. All right. Well, Shukapau, um, actually, one second, because I want to 
Yeah, I, I just found it. And what, what's interesting, I do want to uh, – not, not to uh, – not to absolve because we've all done things in the past that were where we weren't sensitive before. So I'm not trying to say no, but really it's okay. But I do want to mention you mentioned Hip Tanaka earlier in the show. Uh, Hip Tanaka, among lots of other great, great things, was the composer for Super Mario Land. And if you listen to the very beginning of the Chai Kingdom theme from Super Mario Land, it is that exact melody that you just gave me. That yeah. And so yeah, a lot of people didn't think about it much. It didn't seem racist. It's just that people weren't really thinking about the way it was being used, particularly exactly. American white people. Yeah, it was unthinking appropriation is really kind of kind of nailed the, it how it yep. was. So, so yep. there you go. So um, but I, I, I know if there's anybody else who little melodies like register in their brains and make them think of something, if there was anybody out there listening, like, is he going to mention it? I had to mention it. So <laughs> um, you talk a little about your history with Mario Sunshine. Um, so Super Mario Sunshine was the first video game I ever played. I'm pretty sure. Oh, wow. I think it might be. If it wasn't this, it was Kirby's Epic Yarn, but it was one or, one yeah. or the other. Um, it's it's like the earliest thing I can re- really remember playing, and I remember just having a blast with this game. Shoot is 16, and uh, so born in 2005, the GameCube had been out for a little while, but I also skipped the GameCube generation. For me, it was because I thought I was outgrowing games, and then I immediately regretted it when I sold all my stuff. Ugh. Um, yeah, yeah. But, and I think I think that um, I, I can I can relate to that because PC games, Super Smash Brothers, mainly. <laughs> P- PC games at the turn of the century seemed more adult, whereas Mario mm-hmm. felt like for kids. And little did I know, right. Mario's for everybody, and I would actually have to come back and pray at the altar of Mario for my for my literal <laughs> rent paying career. So, but yeah, I, I know what you're um, saying. But so when I got a Wii, I uh, realized to play the GameCube games, and so I could go back and play some of the stuff that I remembered playing, like my friends would rent it or I, my my friends in college had it or whatever. And I got Mario Sunshine from actually a friend who said, "Hey, I, I like this, okay, but I'm never going to play it again. Your kid seems to like it because we had gone over and." shoot was playing around with it and so she just gave it to us and then yeah so then you started playing it all the time shoot and continue go ahead you were talking about how it's uh sorry i cut you off and then i had to yeah, tell you yeah. yeah pick up where i left off um you were talking about how it's one of your favorites one of your early ones uh what are some things specifically that you remember about it now do you feel like um, it would age well <laughs> so i do i don't i don't remember really many of the hard levels like the Friggin' Pachinko Machine and Lily Pad level come to mind when you say hard levels in Mario Sunshine. Um, and we have to mention rolling a big watermelon. <laughs> oh my <laughs> god! Bleep that! Oh my god! By that, I'm I'm bleeping myself there. Uh, just a big old <laughs> f those those watermelons. Wow! <laughs> Yikes! Oofa doofa! Yeah, friggin' watermelons. Uh, but yeah, where was it going? Oh yeah, um, I remember seeing like how all of the different areas were like connected on the world map, and thinking, "Oh my gosh, that's so cool! I can see the, I can see the theme park from here. I can see the airport from here. Yeah, I can yeah. see like Bianco Hills from here." And it was just like super cool as a kid seeing all that. And Absolutely. Yeah, I remember having a lot of fun with Flood, especially like the Hover Pack. Of course, Hover Pack's great. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, which stage was my favorite? <sighs> I feel like we can rule out Pianta Village. Cause, ugh, like, yeah, with all of its under ugh. underground fence crawling crap. Ugh. Mm, yeah, Don't I think like I think level. that's the one, right? I only played through the game yeah, once. Yeah, that's but, the yeah. one. Yep. Oof. Yeah. Delfino um, Plaza is great as a hub world. It's one of the best hubs, I think, it's really um, good. in Mario games. It's, yeah. uh, as far as aside from that, it's really hard because they all have their strengths. For me, despite the, the watermelon thing, I think I really like the beach level. I forget what it's called, but, um, that particular beach. I think besides Pianta Village, the one I like the least is the, the hotel area. 
would have like all the stingrays that come up on the beach, and then you go in the hotel, and you've got the ghosts. It's probably going to be between Penna Park and uh, Rico Harbor for my favorite. Rico Harbor, oh, though, that's, I mean, that's, that's it, another thing. I, I remember that the hotel level, the manta ray fight, took me so long because, like, I couldn't figure out what the heck, like, how the heck to beat it. All these little paint manta rays are, like, swimming up onto the beach, and I think they come in waves, and it's it, it's not super intuitive, but... Uh, the thing is, there's this big manta ray that if you, if you shoot it with water, it splits into more little manta rays. It's like a hydra fight. <laughs> yeah, sort of. What were you saying about Rico Harbor, Brent? Oh, just like... And I mean, keeping in mind, I first played this in my early 30s, um, <laughs> but it, it just... There, I don't know, like, the thing about the Delfino Plaza tune, if I may, is that, you know, typically Koji Kondo will make a main theme for a Mario game and then rework it in various uh, genres and meters, and, you know, you hear it over mm-hmm. and over again, particularly starting with Mario 3. Um, but I just think that the Delfino Plaza tune, it just didn't lend itself, like... The Rico Harbor, if I'm not mistaken, has this kind of ska kind of uh, take on it, and it reminds me a lot of the late '90s, early 2000s um, America's Funniest Home Videos reskin, where Tom Bergeron was now the guy, and their theme song was weirdly like like mainstream ska for grandma. I don't know. Um, <laughs> wow. Wow, that just popped back. I hadn't thought about that in years, <laughs> and it just came back into my head. I think I think anyone that like looks for like the the late '90s, early 2000s, you know, when they started calling it AFV theme song, mm-hmm. and then compare that to the Rico Harbor, uh, you know, music from Mario Sunshine, I feel like there's a there, there's a they are kin, they are kin <laughs> with each other. All right. Well, um, since I got to shoot talk a little bit, we have. Um, extended this particular phase a little bit, but now we're getting into um, if I remember correctly, the turnaround on this particular with lyrics video was really, really impressive because you came out with this one really shortly after the game came out. Uh, and the without lyrics, of course, is also really, really great. And this is just a fantastic tune, of course. What are we going to be listening to next, Brent? This will be my arrangement of Shovel Knight with lyrics, but it is my arrangement. So it is Shovel Knight without lyrics, the title theme of Shovel Knight. That was the title theme remix of Shovel Knight, also known as Shovel Knight without lyrics. Originally composed, of course, by Jake Kaufman and arranged by Brentel Floss. All right. Uh, so, Brent, go ahead. 
So how basically, did you uh, adapt Jake Kaufman for lyrics? <laughs> this is I I think for for the people that listen to your show going to be it's a story I haven't really told because I haven't ever thought it would be interesting to the re- the regulars, the normals that listen to most things. <laughs> so I'm, I'm excited to tell you. So step one, you said it was one of the fastest turnarounds. It was speculated that I had some kind of brand deal with them. Pfft, I wish. No, I just <laughs> I just happened to buy the game on launch day. I think I'd seen something about it and I'd heard, oh, it's it combines the mechanics of Zelda 2 and DuckTales and Mega Man. And I was like, this looks cool. So I beat it in like two days, but the music was out of this world. And I vaguely knew Vert, a.k.a. Jake Kaufman. We'd like met briefly. He knew of me. I knew of him. But I didn't really appreciate him as a composer until Shovel Knight. And so I immediately started doing a lyric Thing number one is I thought I was going to start – I thought I was going to do a lyric for the Spectre Night stage for a Halloween video, which I ended up doing uh, mm-hmm. a full six six and change years later. Uh, <laughs> this past Hall- – well, tw- Hall- Halloween 2020, I did the Spectre Night one. But um, so it basically – really good. <laughs> thanks. Yeah, I believe – the I believe Shovel Knight with lyrics came out like something like seven or eight days after the launch of the game, maybe more. But I turned the whole thing around in about six days. So my math somewhere in there might be a few days off, but it was quick. The thing that is interesting about this one beyond that is I was like, this is going to really be a chunk to arrange. And I'm trying to crank this video out like ASAP because at the time, that was one of the only times I was doing truly regular uploads I think I was doing twice a week and typically I was doing like a with lyrics music video every two weeks which god doing that by yourself I don't, I don't know how I did it I, I, do, I do not know how I did it and I, I sort of did it again this past uh, you know in, in late 2020 and again don't know how I did it it's just going into a mode but the point is that Jake showed me where I could download the NSF files of the soundtrack because he composed it with a uh, I believe it's called a tracker meaning Mm -hmm. he composed it with the same kind of technology one would have used to actually make music for an NES I believe there were more tracks than the NES would have on the the, on those five channel yeah yeah, I, I the NES the NES had um by default it had three main channels and then like um a noise channel that that could be used for sound effects and such. Um, there were some like Konami and especially Sunsoft had some add-ons that they did in their games where they could add like mm-hmm. an extra layer. And I think that Vert did something similar, but by and large he stayed very very true in his composition of Shovel Knight to the the old the old tracker style Absolutely. of composing. Yeah, so. and I mean, whereas whereas my composing style typically is very much about the melody versus the chords. Chord progression is key, and the melody is moving around a lot. The chords are moving around a lot. Jake is so good at having so many um, his ability to to kind of round out the melody with harmonies, counter melodies, all kinds of things happening at the same time just absolutely laps mine by a factor of five but here's the deal he gave me the nsf and i found out at the time there was like a plug-in with my audio software where you could take uh you could take a recording of music and if it was easy enough for the plug-in to understand it would convert it to midi so i basically exported every track of the nsf converted that to MIDI, first off, what I didn't know is, at least this particular NSF file did not have an exact beats per minute. It was Ooh. like a very high, it was like a very small decimal, so I had to like do a lot of quantizing. If you don't know what that means, just don't even worry about it. Uh, <laughs> but the, the point is that I had, on the one hand, I had a really um, authentic, I mean, as authentic as you can get, of an arrangement of this tune. But because I was working with the exact tracks, but also trying to make it sound like my own, I tried to, you know, go the other way and try to make little uh, counter melodies that weren't in the original. And, you know, when we were listening to it, uh, Bedroth, uh, we were, when we were listening to it, you mentioned the cowbell. And one thing that I did with this one is 
I there there is no cowbell, but rather I found sound effects of shovels hitting things. So the percussive <laughs> sounds that you hear on the two and the four for part of the song are shovel clangs, and um, you know it was a weird mix of orchestral, but also synth. There's like one or two instances here or there where I actually do have the original NSF file do some 8-bit stuff to kind of maintain that flavor. Mm-hmm. But um yeah, I just I just really like I like how it tees itself up. I like how the the drums combine what's cool about a drum set but also like in a slightly more orchestral snare kind of way, almost like a military march kind of way. And um, and like, let's be real. It's just a really good tune. It's it's much easier to make a great arrangement out of a really fun tune that you like than taking something that you know you find to be so so and 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 having fun with it. Yeah, it it, it it really. I mean, it seems obvious in your story that this is just one of those songs, like you mentioned, that just cries out for for lyrics. Like it seems like it was written to be sung. Absolutely. And and the the Shovel Knight soundtrack is. In very very heavy contention, I think for one of for one of the best video game soundtracks in the last ten years. Oh, when you for talk sure. about when you talk about a, a, it's not even really a genre as much as a medium. When you talk about a medium like video game music and the diverse um, amount of genres that go into it, it's really hard, I think, to narrow that down, even within a given year, but especially in a decade. But just for the sheer brilliance of composition the 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 challenges that he gave himself and overcame in the implementation it's just such a such a feat and every song in the game is is enjoyable and it, it lends itself to that particular theme the way and i know that manami matsumai composed a couple of tracks but the way that i i think that jake did jake took that thing that we all felt like we felt like the tunes in Mega Man games sort of lent themselves thematically, I guess, to the level that they were in. Mm-hmm. Um, Metal Man Stage has some, like, uh, sort of, you know, some sharp uh, percussive sounds. Um, Spark Man Stage in Mega Man 3 has some sort of electronic sounds. Um, Air Man Stage, Bubble Man Stage, I think both of those you could sort of at least fake yourself into thinking, oh, this really sounds like a, a water stage. It sounds like a stage in the sky. Yeah. Jake took those things that we all thought we were hearing and made them totally real. Like his, yeah. his music, it, it fits in the stages that it's in. And that's one of my favorite things about Shovel Knight. Well, and, and one thing you said, I want to just I want to just quickly chime in on. You know, when I try to explain to some of my friends and family the way, and you know, I try to explain to them how video game music is and also isn't a genre of music. You know, what I compare it to is musical theater, because musical theater is a medium through which almost any genre can pass. And like, you know, mm-hmm. ten years ago, you might have said, well almost any genre not like hip-hop it's like well hamilton showed up (laughs) and said actually um but you know i think that's part of why the with lyric series is successful because you know when when you are in a musical in high school or whatever you hear those songs over and over and over again so even if you didn't love them at first they get into your blood they become part of you and you have a special love for them because you heard them over and over and over and over again well it's exactly the same as when you played a video game. If I was in the cast of some random show like Pippin with somebody in high school, well, we were in the same show, so we will always find those songs to be special to us. But if we all independently played a game but heard the music, then in a way we were all kind of brought together in the same show, in the same musical and and, and learning and experiencing all the music. We just didn't happen to be in the same room and doing it at the same time. Um, Mm -hmm. Anyway, I was reminded of that, and I think that on a show like yours, if that has never been painted that way, I think it's an interesting way of looking at the ways in which it is and is not a genre. I think that's incredibly um, pertinent to, uh, to what we do here. And, you know, with musical theater you could go to to college or even to high school and you can find other music theater nerds and you could sit down and actually watch you know a video of a lot of them or if a, if a show came to Dallas you could actually go and see these shows there wasn't anything like that for fans of 
like video game music. Back Certainly then. not. And so yeah. I think with uh, with the advent of things like like YouTube, um, Discord, Twitter, the social media we have, um, double edged sword that it is, but also with podcasts. Now I think one of the reasons that so many of us have started doing this is because now we have that outlet. We have that way to get together and connect over this thing that we've been sort of distantly connected um, through for all of these years. And Absolutely. So, yeah, uh, definitely. Thank you for making that point. I, I want to bring a couple of honorable mentions up. Um, a couple of other without lyrics uh, uh of your tunes I really like. I love your arrangement of Final Fantasy VII just because you go so many places in that medley. Oh, wow. Thanks. That's a that's a, a deep cut if you ask me. But thank <laughs> you. And, and and we know that Daniel we know that Daniel uh, Tidwell did the, um, the the guitar section on that. That was ripped from his uh, from his cover of that, but everything else in that. Oh one yeah, was the 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 hard the hard um like the metal version, the, the battle games, theme. Many I think. games, so yes, many, yes. so many mini games. Yeah, 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 that yeah. Part. yeah. You did mention that. Um, on all these things are of course mentioned in your show notes, um, um, but or in your in your video notes. Um, the I, men- I already mentioned the Mega Man three end credits with lyrics or without lyrics that you did for season twelve. Um, I love your Bubble Bobble. I think it's one of the first ones that I that I heard from you is Bubble Bobble with lyrics, and the uh, the approach that you took to Bubble Bobble without lyrics I thought was really fun. That's such a catchy tune. <laughs> it's such an it earworm. It is, but I always hated how it was harmonized in its original form because it made you feel like it should just be a little bit more bluegrass chords. Now you did notice that I put chopsticks in there at one point. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Just wanted to, <laughs> as long as we're talking about it, you know, it's like, I just, if somebody notices, then that makes my day. So great. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, you're familiar with OC Remix, I guess. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. There's um, it's like a hillbilly bubble bobble or something like that. It's a version of this tune uh, that's got some, like some jaw harp and a little bit of banjo and it really lends itself to that. It sounds really, really cool. Um, limbo with lyrics is just it's it's a it's a brilliant take on that um because you actually bring in like you, you, the wordplay of limbo in in your in your with lyrics and without lyrics i, I really like that arrangement thanks it was trying to make evil evil uh caribbean limbo music <laughs> with a fun with a fun major key chorus so thanks for noticing and I think the last one I'll mention is um, the karaoke version of the Ballad of the Mages. Um, oh wow! It's just oh, it's just so good. It's um, I- I'm a sucker for uh, like acoustic sort of plucked string type stuff, mm-hmm. um, uh, Americana or singer songwriter type stuff like James Taylor and uh, David Wilcox. Um, uh, I already mentioned. Gosh, his name, uh, Don McLean. Um, that's my thing. And so I really like the, this, that sort of simple guitar. And this is a really, it's a, it's a really poignant song. And you, you got these, these puppets and it's this video game theme. And it just, it, it's, it's such a much more emotional song than it seems like it would be on the surface. And the Ballad Thanks. of the Mages is just really, really good stuff. I like Thanks. it. Thanks. That was me, that was me accidentally writing a song about, about white male privilege. Um, yeah, there because you go. The red mage is like, oh, who am I anyway? Oh, I've got so much to worry about. Am I this or am I that? Whereas, like, the woman's like, nobody treats me like an equal, and the black mage is like, nobody treats me like an equal. <laughs> and yep. I didn't mean to write it that way, but in retrospect, that's what the song, at its heart, is about. And uh, thanks for noticing that. One little fun fact about the Ballad of the Mages. I at one point knew a lot of ukulele chords, and then I lost my skills. So. The ukulele you hear in that, I got a, a ukulele that has a pickup so I could like hook it right into my recording software, but I actually recorded one chord at a time, strumming one chord, then looking wow. up the next chord, strumming that, and then stitched it all together to where it kind of sounded like... Now, if you go in knowing that, next time you listen, sorry that I've cursed you, next time you listen, you'll hear <laughs> that the... The qualities of one strum to the next sound just different enough that it's like a, a master ukulele player might be like, that wasn't live. But um, I appreciate <laughs> it. That's that's in that's one of my favorite things I've ever written musically. Uh, and, and you know, I, I wrote it, but I also kind of borrowed the main theme of it. It's it's a it's a transformative work. But in any case, I appreciate your appreciation of it. Well, and I think the ones that uh, resonate with me most 
you're sort of leaning into your um, your chops in uh, musical theater writing because two of my favorites are Ballad of the Mages and then the Ballad of Jeff, which both of those could fit. If you were going to make a musical about that game, both of these would just slot right in, I think. And, that makes sense, um, yeah. yeah. And so you're in your wheelhouse, I think, with these. And the other ones, you know, they're fun. They can be lyrically impressive. Of course, the music is good. But these two have got, again, we're coming back to that heart that you mentioned. I think they've got heart. And so I, I do play a little bit of ukulele myself, so I'll listen for that next time. <laughs> but um, what, what size ukulele do you play? Oh, it's standard. When you use it. Um, it's just a standard? Okay, gotcha. Yeah, and I mean, I, I I bought it thinking I would learn how to play it. I learned a little bit, and then it has mostly just been on the shelf. But it's it's a standard, uh, standard ukulele with a pickup. If I knew how to play piano, I never would have bothered. But I always wanted to have something I could carry around and play and sing at the same time. And so that's why I eventually picked up ukulele. It's it's uh, so portable. Mm-hmm. It is super portable, and it's really it's easy to start learning. And there's a lot of depth to it as well. So I'll never be um, what's his name, Jake uh, Shimmy Bakura, uh, who uh, does all the amazing ukulele yeah. plays online. But but I can manage so. <laughs> Well, that's going to round out our uh, second part, and now we're getting into some original Brentelfloss VGM. And so I'm, I'm a little surprised I didn't expect you to bring all tracks from uh, Chicken Nights, but, uh, you know, we're in for... <laughs> <laughs> I honestly, when you mentioned three, I was like, ugh, because Chicken Nights, man, <laughs> like that should be like the music that, you know, that takes us out of the show because... I did for this obscure little math game. I, I wrote a soundtrack that almost every song had me harmonizing with myself, like the Muppet Chickens, <laughs> and uh, it didn't make didn't make the top three. But it was a tough call. Have you ever heard Ray Stevens' version of "In the Mood," the old jazz standard? Oh my God, no! It's it's sung by chickens. <laughs> So in, <laughs> it's, is it called In the Brood? Because I, I feel like it's right there. Oh, that's, a, that's such a lost it's opportunity. Right no, there. I, I, I think it's just In the Mood. I think it's just his version. I always just called it the chicken song. <laughs> My dad had it and has, still has actually an oldies uh, radio show that he does every Saturday nights. And every once in a while, he would throw me a bone and play me a silly song by one of the artists that he would you know feature anyway. And um, two I always requested from Ray Stevens were um, the Mississippi Squirrel Revival and the chicken song which is just Ugh. it's just in the mood but with chickens <laughs> fun fun i actually I, not to get too far afield but i have a i'm currently writing a star trek musical and it has a number called when the chickens come home um that has a, a, a backup band of mutant space chickens while captain kirk sings about the mistakes he's made in his life <laughs> Um, so as you can see, if you add that together with the fact that I put random chickens into Earthbound with lyrics, doing the video game soundtrack of Chicken Nights awakened something in me. <laughs> My inner Muppet chicken <laughs> hasn't gone away. Oh, uh, what is, oh, what is Gonzo's chicken, um, I guess, friend? Oh, kind it's of like something Ella, like... Camilla? Camilla, there you go. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> Oh, man. I don't even remember what we're talking about now, but I don't care. This is so much fun. <laughs> uh, I feel like there was something else. Oh, when you mentioned um, Hamilton a minute ago, I thought about the line from... from um, I, I'm listening slowly, piece by piece, to the reading that recently that we recently did of uh, of Khan, the the musical, and the part where um, where Data says it worked for former President Lin Manuel Miranda. That just popped into my head when you when you mentioned that a second ago. Um, I, I do recommend anybody who is able to um, to listen. I think you posted this on um, on the Twitter that's associated with, uh, yeah, with the musical. Yeah, yeah, and 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 so the thing is that. Um a reading of a musical is exactly what it sounds like. This one was somewhat rehearsed, but it's a lot of people reading mm-hmm. their lines off of a page, so it's like not very polished, but you get a chance to see how the show works. And my you know, musical, which is a parody of Star Trek, specifically Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan, um, there's a video of that over at twitter.com slash U-A-S-T-P-M. That stands for Unauthorized Star Trek Parody Musical. <laughs> That's twitter.com slash U-A-S-T-P-M. It's in one of the recent tweets. And, uh, yeah, it's, if you if you this sounds interesting to you and you really want to want to watch the show, this this is not the show, but it is for, for people who are I am not 
an aficionado, aficionado by any means, but I, I enjoy musical theater, and so for me, it's like interesting to watch something like this. Um, I'm also not an uber Star Wars nerd, and you mentioned being interested in knowing how how we we took it, and so I'm, I'm going to watch it and kind of give you my thoughts. But Great. Um, and I even said Star Wars, Ugh, Star Trek nerd. Um, well, the I'm not thing a great is, big Star you, you, Wars nerd either, but I have at least. I was going to say <laughs> you made yourself clear either way. <laughs> I, I I smelled what you were cooking. Well, um, that's going to close out our um, arrangements section. And so now we're going to kind of go from your Im- impressions, or not your impressions, your influences, to then your, I guess, impressions is a good word for these, these arrangements. And now we're going to get into your original VGM. And uh, this first track I actually have heard because I think it made its sort of public debut on um, on Game That Tune. And I think that you played this song for them. Um if I'm remembering correctly, it might have been something else from the same game. But yeah, I, I'm almost positive it was this one. This is my favorite VGM tune I've ever written. And you, I, I know you haven't heard this before. At least I'd be surprised if you did. You are really, really going to enjoy this. Uh, Brent, talk a little about this, and then we'll play it, and we'll talk a little more. <laughs> so, um, in late 2013, I told the world via YouTube I was going to be a video game composer. Um, and started taking on commissions to work on various games for, like, dirt cheap. Uh, a Scandinavian game developer was making a game called Flavored Cats uh, <laughs> that ended up being uh, canceled. But they had an idea for, like, um, a level that basically, like, there was a winter version of a certain theme and a spring version or a summer version of the same theme. And this was the winter one, and basically I just thought of every fun wintry tune particularly from mario games like toward the end of this one when you hear the accordion come in it's very mario 64 but um i just love this tune and i i call it winter athletic theme because at this point i don't even remember what it was supposed to be for that <laughs> other game i bought the rights back and now it is just winter athletic theme i guess in search of a game to be in I love the montage of cold stages from games. Thanks. I thought that might sell it when I made a video of it. Man, I really got to start playing Banjo-Kazooie. <laughs> it's but, a classic. I was going to earlier, but I couldn't figure out how to set up the emulator. Very good game. Highly recommended. Fun tunes. Cold areas in games have such great music. Oh, yeah. They're some of the most iconic ones because, you know, it gives the composer license to do just different flavors of things that might seem out of place without the notion of cold and winter. Ice cap zone. Like Stardew Valley, once it turns, you know, the, every year goes through all four seasons. Um, and by the time you get to winter, there are some actually very 
somber, even depressing tunes that play mm -hmm. just during the day, just when you're outside, just doing your thing on Stardew Valley. And like the winter context gives the composer license to do something that is a different flavor. And while usually the direction it goes is not somber, it just, you know, tinkly, these things that evoke snow. Anyway, we could get into it, but yeah. I do want to mention briefly uh, Ice Cap Zone, actually, which is one of the ones you featured in the video, is uh, maybe the song that really got me into video game music. It was one of the first times I really, really noticed, man, I'm having a lot of fun with this tune. And I, I would go around and like hum different, different things, but Ice Cap Zone was one of the ones that really stuck with me. It wasn't until years later that I found out it was actually a, 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 a pop song by... Um, Michael Jackson's friend who helped with the, yeah, with the music. Yeah, I was about so, to say, I've heard that too. Uh, so, um, but, and of course, uh, Shuka Pao mentioned Banjo Kazooie because Free CCP came on. Um, also a great theme. Last year, such if, a great if theme. Anybody, uh, is kind of new to, to the show and hasn't gone back, if you want to explore some of those two different sides of Winter VGM, last year we actually did two winter episodes and the first one was, um, more, like what you were talking about with the Stardew Valley theme, sort of the darker side of winter. And then the next one was more of like the upbeat um, holiday festive side of winter. And so that yeah. was, that was really fun to put those two together. But this one, of course, I, uh, fits into that, um, that first round or that, that not first. This one fits into that second theme. It's uh, definitely got that festive feel to it with, uh, I, um, the the bells um, that, that you play the, the the keyboard here um, losing all of my words. Well, there's, there's <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's glockenspiel, but then the tubular bells come in to go. give it a yeah. real crisp. Yeah, and those tubular bells give it a real Christmassy feel too when they show up here and there. And I did hear some sleigh bells. I think faintly in the background. I think those are those tend to be overused in winter tracks, but they were very tastefully done here. Um, Thank you. <laughs> and I agree on both counts. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, there are shortcuts that uh, I think when they're used as, as seasoning, they're good. But when they're used as the meat of the song, if it's if it's not sleigh ride, you just kind of lay off a little bit. But <laughs> certainly true. Yes. Shukapa, what did you think of this one? It was really good. I liked it a lot. Is it's, it's, yes. It's what you Capel? It's very good music. <laughs> we have to work that in at least once. It's podcast. what? Very good music. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, well, cool. Talk a little about your. Uh, th this does. I'll say the last thing I'll say on this is this does sound like Mario by way of Brental Floss. This has some of those those flares that you kind of alluded to throughout the show that I think are sort of distinctively your style. Um, but while at the same time fitting into sort of the tradition that I think you're trying to go for here. Yeah, well, you know, what I like about this song is that I don't actually think it sounds... I. I see what you mean about by way of rental floss. When you zoom way out, you think about the chords, the corniness of it, like corniness and bounciness is something that I think a lot of composers these days aren't really, that they're probably more avoiding. And I'm mm -hmm. like, no, 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 that's the good stuff. That's the fun <laughs> stuff. Um, and so what I like most about it is that I was just writing so much music, so determined to be a video game composer, which that kind of fizzled out. But I, I still I still am working on one these days. Um, but I'll put that aside to say this, cool. um, that I was writing a ton of video game music and I had to get good at just thinking of an idea and then going with it. And the idea of something that goes... You know, one, two, three, and ba da ba 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 da ba ba three, four, one, ba da ba. Like that kind of phrasing is not what I usually do. Um, the, coming in on the one and is weird. It's a weird thing for me to do, but basically it was just one of those times where you just kind of have like a da 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 ba 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 da ba ba, and you're like, okay, well, I'm gonna put this into another chord. I'm gonna put this into another chord, and the thing is, like, it's. It's not a revolutionary piece of music. It does borrow a little bit of that um, Mario 2 slash Doki Doki Panic, you know, ba -ba -da -ba -ba -da -ba -da 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 -da. like those mm -hmm. first two chords oh, yeah. are the same. <laughs> that um, I think that would be like C major to like a B augmented. That's what I think it is. But anyway, but yeah, it just, there's something about it 
Um, it's got fun little call and answer stuff like ba da 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 and the strings go dee 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 like it's it's like they're it's like all the different instruments are kind of like playing around. They're all throwing snowballs at each other. I don't know if other composers do this, but when I'm composing, it's usually arranging at the same time. I do not just compose piano tracks unless they're meant to just be a piano. So I play around with the different instruments. There's some Muppet Show stuff like you know. It's time to play the music. I don't know how many listeners actually remember the original Muppet Show. Oh, but man, I do. <laughs> like, that's very present here. And, yeah, I just had a lot of fun with it. Definitely went to the Mario 64 place when I brought that accordion in toward the end. But <laughs> it's just very close to my heart. And it's like having been forced to write a bunch of music because I had made a lot of commitments created the situation where I wasn't thinking. I was just doing and that song just came out of me trying something and going with it. And so it feels like a little song that was gifted to my brain, like the Greeks thought that the muses kind of gifted you ideas. It's kind of like that. Anyway, it's a, it's a cute little tune. I like it. It is. I like it a lot. I like it a lot. And I'm not familiar uh, with, uh, with this next one. Um, what are we going to be coming into now? So, um, <laughs> this is also from a canceled game. <laughs> I, uh, I wrote the, um, I wrote the title theme and the spooky level theme for a game called Buck and Miles that was actually, if it had hit its crowdfunding goal, would have also had on the out, al- uh, the soundtrack would have also been written by Vert, aka Jake Kaufman of Shovel Knight fame and Alexander Brandon, who I know best as the composer of Deus Ex. Um, wow. from the late 90s, early 2000s, and it didn't hit its Kickstarter goal. But oh, man. Um, yeah, um, I think that the developers still doing their thing, but, um, you know, I was asked to do the title theme and also, like, the spooky level called Haunted Valley. And so this is supposed to be a 16-bit inspired tune, but not completely uh, married to the kind of sound fonts and the kind of chip... Uh, technology that would have been available for a 16-bit era console. But it's, again, you know, it's pretty simple. It's it's not, you know, 12-tone, achromatic, George Crumb kind of stuff. <laughs> this is just goofy, like, what I want you to do when you're listening is feel your shoulders start to do that Bob Fosse thing, like you're kind of like one of those zombies in Thriller, but you're kind of just slinking down the sidewalk. And, um, <laughs> It's from Haunted Valley. I think I may have said that. The, the level, the name of the level is Haunted Valley. But um, I want to point out two things. In the bridge, there's this little bit that gets kind of Baroque with like a harpsichord. That is actually um, a reworking of the title theme of this game. I wish... It's just one of those things where it's like, you know, doing a motif is so fun, but people have to have heard the other version of it to know that it's a motif. Mm-hmm. But also, the final iteration of the verse is absolutely an homage to Grant Kirkhope Banjo-Kazooie spooky levels. Um, Very like cool. Like, directly and specifically. Anyway, yeah, so that's Haunted Valley, Buck and Miles, R.I.P.
I'm curious if you'll hear the Grant Kirkhope 64 era feel toward the end. Yeah, I think I'm picking that up. Once the drums drop out. When everything cuts out and it's just the Glock. And then, you know, the, the ambient sounds in the back. Yeah. Yeah. And then the tuba. <laughs> yep. Or Barry Sax. One of those, one of those low sax. brass Barry things. Barry Sax, yeah. Yeah. Definitely Barry Sax. It's got that sort of dirtier sound to it. Yeah. I definitely did pick up on that. And I, uh, even though he's never played it, Shoot is actually more familiar, I think, with the soundtrack to Banjo-Kazooie than I am because um, I... Uh, I really enjoy it. I love Kirk Hope in all his permutations, um, but the Banjo Kazooie soundtrack is definitely one of one of the ones that Shoot has on repeat. So, <laughs> you know, if you like Banjo Kazooie, I recently played through Mario plus Rabbids, and I mean, like Grant Kirk Hope and I have interacted. Oh, yeah. He's a, he seems like a really really swell guy. I will say, I was shocked at how much the Mario plus Rabbids soundtrack sounds like. It's in the Banjo Kazooie universe. Um, it could just be a matter of using similar chords and phrasings, but like, it really feels like if you want to close your eyes and imagine there's some canceled Banjo Kazooie game that was never, you know, and by that I don't <laughs> mean Banjo Banjo Three Ye, which they should have made, um, <laughs> right? But uh, you know, if you can't get enough of it and you're playing ukulele and all that, Mario Plus Rabbids definitely has some of that flavor. I think, uh, shoot, you're a little familiar with Mario Plus Rabbids, right? Yeah. I mean, I've I've beaten the game, so. <laughs> yeah, that's another just one. Just a little, a, little, we're, um, a little familiar. Fun. But we're here to talk about your music here. So Haunted Valley. And um, this was just really fun. I was, um, you know, bouncing back and forth with uh, that, that, that beat you had going there. Really groovy stuff. I guess you talked about sort of the how this came into being. Did you want to talk any more about the like composition of the track or anything else you wanted to go, go into about this? Um, you know, this one was probably like 2014 or 15. So one cool thing. And and I, and I imagine the two of you, I imagine everyone listening has some, some uh, analogy to this in their lives, but it's cool to like hear something that you wrote so long ago that you can't really remember and you have to sort of interpret it like a historian of yourself. <laughs> um, but uh, just something about the dun, 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 dun. Like it's such it's such a um, basic, you know, like it's it's 101 crap. Dun, 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 dun. But then you got this this weird like, you know, instead of going bum, 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 bum. It's gonna go bum 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 like mm-hmm. dun, 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 dun. that's like a weird phrase for me to do. What is that even? One dun, dun, dun. It's like a like a six lit or a fast triplet. I don't even know. Um, but it was just fun, and it just got more fun as I kept doing it. And then, you know, looping in the title theme of what would have been Buck and Miles to the bridge was, felt very satisfying. And doing that like baroque harpsichordy thing, I think I was just trying to do a showcase of like. A lot of different uh, instrumentations and feels. And also, I believe the client kept saying, okay, could we get one more verse? Like, this is kind of a repetitive, like, it's a short loop. And I would always be like, well, NES games had loops of 45 (laughs) seconds sometimes. But to his point, it was not 1987. Um, So Mm -hmm. that's where, like, the very different feel uh, of that last verse comes in. But, yeah, I just, that was one of those tunes that, as I got farther and far away from composing it, I enjoyed it more and more as a listener because I didn't feel like I had actually composed it, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I've got a couple that are like that, too. Shoot, do you have any of your uh, your songs that are like that for you? Where you've, you can enjoy them as a listener, uh, divorced from the fact that you wrote them? Oh, yeah, totally. Just um, wait till you're 30. I feel, like, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the big one is Newer York. That's a recent one for you, but yeah, we played that on our... Yeah. Um, on our bonus where we talked about it. That's, that's one of my favorites of your composition. So, um, I also want to say Brent for, um, for haunted Valley. This is, um, I'll say the same thing here about the theremin that I said about the sleigh bells on the last one. Very tasteful use of theremin for this one. It was, was not too much. (laughs) Thanks. Yeah. I like to, I like to, um, I like to make use of tropes, but perhaps when I'm at my best, I would say not leaning on them. That's the hope. 
All right, well, we're coming up on our last tune, and uh, we we do talk a little bit after the last song on this one, and then we'll um you know we'll we'll pick a, a kind of a goofier one to play out with a little bit later. But uh, what um this is the uh, default Dan or Buck and Miles the ending credits theme. Oh yeah, no this this is this is yeah default Dan default um, Dan. It's got it's, it's got the same background sort of, but not but not Buck and Miles. Yeah, this is for a different game. Right, right. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> all right. I'm tired, um, and it's not even almost midnight for me. So <laughs> all right, <laughs> well, go ahead and talk a little about uh, about this one or ending credits so default, for the show, as it were. <laughs> default, yes, exactly. That's why I picked it um, for the last one. Default Dan is a game. Uh, the concept of which it never got very far and it wasn't the most polished game, but the concept was brilliant. It was like, what if you made a Mario game where everything that's good in the Mario game is bad? What if coins kill you, spikes are good, things like mushrooms and muffins that come out of a block kill you, um, and so you have to rewire your <laughs> whole brain to suddenly think the opposite of everything you grew up on and everything that influenced everything, you know, or rather, everything that was influenced by that. Uh, and so I played a demo of this game at a convention, and what I'm about to describe is the most me move. And <laughs> it's not the best part of me, but it is a very me move. I was so annoyed that the music was... And I mean, look, the guy that the guy that composed the music was also one of the devs. Very sweet guy. But I think he... Uh, I think he was the first to know I felt this way um, because he was my point of contact. I thought the music just sucked out loud, um, like bad. And I was like, look, let me just I won't even charge you very much. Let me just make you a better soundtrack before you release your final, you know, your your 1.0 version because they were still in beta. And um, it was fun. It was a lot more work than I thought. I think to this day, it's one of the only... It's the only game with that long of a soundtrack I've ever done. I think like 20 tracks or something. Wow. And, um, but, you know, earlier I was talking about manipulating a virtual instrument, particularly a wind instrument, to sound real. And part of it is figuring out how much, how much to turn up the dial on what's called expression, which with a wind instrument is really how hard are they blowing. Um, I hadn't figured out that that knob existed. This was the first tune I ever wrote with a digital trombone that was like a high quality instrument. So I love this track, but you'll notice the trombone sounds like it's the trombone version of whispering. <laughs> like <laughs> I'm trying not to let anyone know I'm playing the trombone. Um, but it still somehow <laughs> works and creates this very chill, like you'll hear it interact with what I believe is an alto sax. And they make this nice little lazy harmony toward the middle of it. Um, but yeah, it's very fun. And, 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 you know, as my favorite song, so many of them from video game music are ending credits themes. I had to make it fun and a fun way to take the player out especially considering that the game is so hard, probably less than 5% of players ever heard this tune. So yeah, ending credits from Default Dan.
That was the Default Dan ending credits uh, by Brent Black, our final song for the evening, not counting the blooper reel track. And that was delightful. <laughs> that was, Thanks. I really enjoyed that. Chukapau, what did you think of that? Um, so I, I, in, in this, this Discord server I'm in, someone posted this, like, this, this thing. It was, it was sort of like, it's just like a Sonic fan dub. And I was, I was watching it while listening to the track, and it was just like five times funnier. <laughs> Whatever I can do to enhance your Discord comedy <laughs> with this song that probably nobody has, like, probably now about three times the amount of people that had previously heard this song have heard it based on just tonight <laughs> and this podcast. Well, I'm glad to bring this to more ears. This, this is a lot of fun. Really enjoy it. And, of course, you can't go wrong uh, with me opening up with uh, with Marimba and a little bit of Shaker. It's a really, really, really nice little intro. And then, yeah, when the trombone comes in, and like you said, then when it starts playing with the sax, it's just – it's just this is just really, really fun. It's a really nice – I think this would be a, a good way to um, sort of relax after getting through a really difficult game. So I hope so. This was one of my early, you know – early compositions in video game music where I was like, oh, this feels like, I don't know, just like like sometimes an idea comes to you and, and again, I, as much as I want to be like, oh, I'm really good and I'm really smart and I'm, I'm just awesome. Sometimes like a little notion for a song is a gift. You can run with it. You can make it something cool. But whatever the initial impetus was, is not necessarily under your control or of your making. And this is one of those. So I spun it into something that felt like a little musical reward to say like good for you uh for beating this really hard game and just you know let's have a little party about it well very cool i think that uh party is uh party is the word i would use for this uh because this is actually sort of i i guess kind of a season finale because we have a big guest and so that would make sense but um i think we're gonna be playing next time we're going to be doing our Koji Kondo winter tracks, so all of the the winter tunes that we can find that that he's that he's done. So nice, um, yeah. That's how we're going to do going to do Christmas this time around is um, is Koji Kondo winter tracks. Actually, it's coming out on Christmas. So yeah, I, I'm right. I'm right. I'm remembering this correctly now. So, <laughs> but lovely man. This this has been. Such a good time. Uh, not just getting to talk to you, which has been a blast, but going through this sort of this musical journey we've taken um, that I think will probably resonate with a lot of our a lot of our listeners. We have some composers who listen. We have just uh, you know other fans of video game uh, music. Um, with you're both, both of those things, of course. And um, I, I know that there's going to be a lot of crossover. Just people who enjoy video game music and people who enjoy Brentle Floss. I imagine the Venn diagram probably overlaps quite a bit so i hope so and you know what's funny music musical theater gamers people that are in musical theater and are gamers i'm always shocked at now keeping in mind i'm not a household name y'all i don't get recognized on the street maybe maybe once or twice a year somebody re recognize me in public so the fact that musical theater people that are slightly gamers are familiar it just it's just an interesting thing like if you zoom out, it's like, well, of course they are. But that was never intended by me. You know what I mean? I never, like, made an attempt to go find them. They just found me from the wonders of the algorithm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah, and I guess maybe for some of the reasons that you mentioned, um, the the overlap there is uh, is not not super unexpected. There, there are some similarities. Yeah. So, man, this has been really fun. I... Uh, Shukapau, I want to give you an opportunity. Is there anything in particular that you would like to ask Brent or say to Brent that um, because I ramble so much, you haven't gotten to to get to? I mean, I guess just I really like your work. It's some really good stuff, and it's entertaining and always brings a smile on my face. Hey, thanks. That that means uh, you know that means a lot to hear from someone who. I consider your generation to be removed from people that care about what I did when I was coming up and to know that you are you are familiar and halfway give a crap is huge. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah, it's definitely something that uh, once they were once they were old enough, um, 
past the point that your your nephews were when you made the G-rated lyrics albums for them <laughs> once they were old enough. It's something I um, I definitely bonded with my oldest two over, and it's uh, it's it's a lot of fun. It's you 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 put a lot of a lot of laughs and a lot of joy out there, and um, really looking forward to hearing more of what you do. I I have to mention we're gonna plug use your words. I have not played this game yet. <laughs> Um, because I don't really have anybody to play it with, but we're going to have a couple of additional smartphones in the house after Christmas, I'm pretty sure. So um, I think that we're going to have to uh, to get that one and play around with it some. Cool. And don't forget that any browser-based internet-enabled device can be an input device. So laptop, tablet, phone. Um, it's a weird way to play it sitting around with tablets and laptops, but... Uh, <laughs> anyway, for those listening, but, it's it's a Jackbox style game where you play around the TV or via Zoom, but your input device is a has a little browser and 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 ideally some kind of typing mechanism. And this is a game that you actually um, wrote and developed, correct? Yeah, I basically had the idea, designed the rules, designed the game, and you know, for the uninitiated, design when it comes to game development does not mean the art necessarily. It just means like figuring out the rules, figuring out the balance. Um, So I designed it, took it to a friend of mine who's a veteran developer named Julian Spillane. He coded it. We got a team going. But yeah, like it was it was essentially my idea cobbled together from other, you know, obviously heavily influenced by various other games. But I uh, wrote about 85 percent of the material in the game, sort of oversaw the project from a creative perspective. We'll say creative director. But um, okay, cool. Yeah, very close to my heart. And while I can't announce anything, I will just say it would be super cool if a sequel was on the way. That would be neat. Yeah, I do remember uh, seeing in the um, the ending video for season twelve that there might be something new in the works on the video game scene. So we'll have to uh, we'll have to see. Uh, you also do um, your own regular podcast, if I'm not mistaken. I, d- I do off and on. Um, I did trends like these with Travis McElroy and Courtney Enlow for almost five years. Uh, we just got tired of it um, doing the news during the Trump era. No matter no matter what your stripes were, was a tiring situation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, we we once Biden got the nomination and COVID started to like become a real thing, I was just like, look, <laughs> I, I don't know, I don't know. I don't know um, if I can anyway. do this anymore. And I mean, Travis yeah, left and the show been, by then, and uh, it just yeah, yeah. And I've already yeah. been doing it about ten years or five years. But uh, I do another show, which which is just so different from this one, and probably has <laughs> such a different demographic appeal. But um, we're on hiatus at the moment, but it's called Question Box. We've done sixty episodes of it, and basically, me and one of my best friends, Kate Sloan, she is a sex writer and educator. So, like, mm-hmm. she reviews sex toys for a living. And does seminars on that kind of stuff. And so she brings out my TMI side and we have guests (laughs) on. It's like a game show of personal questions. So we have guests on where we ask them the rudest questions. But it ends up being just telling stories about weird stuff and bodily functions and embarrassing things and childhoods. And so, yeah, that's called Question Box. And um, while it is just so incredibly far afield from anything we've talked about (laughs) on this show, truly... Uh, questionboxshow.com is where you can find it and what I would say is the way into it for some of you if that doesn't sound too R-rated for you is you're almost definitely going to know somebody who's been a guest of ours if you're a VGM fan Gerard the Completionist and his friend in the Super Beard Bros Alex Facciane Mm -hmm. uh, Satchel um, who was Satch Bags in Normal Boots uh, we've had also um, of the big this bad is a bit bosses s- with Gerard and Alex. <laughs> That's right. This is a bit spicy, but the ex-wife of Pro Jared, who's a good friend of mine, by that I mean the wife, um, <laughs> Heidi, <laughs> truly a wonderful person. We had we had uh, Sung Wan Cho, aka Pro ZD. Um, so yeah, um, there's that. That's a. Uh, it was a bit of a ramble there, but that's Question Box again. Just yeah. a weird, weird show, but. We, our audience appreciates the way that we 
create a space to talk about things that maybe make them feel like they're not the only one with that weird thing. Yeah. And I think that's really super important. I mean, it's, it's really, I, I find a lot of people I've been in the video game music podcast scene now, at least as a listener for, I guess, six or seven years, which is crazy to me, but I still see people come in and they're just amazed that there are so many other people that like this weird little niche thing and they feel heard. Um, kind of, it, it makes it sound like maybe a bigger deal than it really is, but but, but they they feel like they're part of something. And absolutely, and absolutely, and like when I started started doing video game conventions and realizing there were other people that cared as much about these things as I did, and in mm-hmm. some cases much more, it <laughs> yeah. made me feel less alone. It made me feel like there was a family I had been waiting to meet. And I want to say that what you're doing with Question Box, that's a, an area that so many people feel not just, you know, um, aloneness, but they feel, you know, shame about. And I think what you're doing there is really, really cool, what you and Kate have going with Question Box. Because Thanks. the more we can, I think, detaboo some of this stuff, the more, you know, the, the more people won't feel weird and maybe even feel compelled to act out in ways that, uh, that, that, that can be harmful. So um, if one if one person made that choice or was led there because of what Kate and I are doing, then the whole 60 episodes was worth it. And finally, we've already alluded to it, but uh, you're working on a, um, a real for real musical. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I've, I've been a Trekkie for, I would say I've been an actual Trekkie for only about 10 years, but um, I just got the idea to do a musical based on the 1982 film, the wrath of Khan. Um, and it is called Con the Musical. <laughs> and um, I've been working on that off and on for about six years. And if for those of you who are Trekkies or, or, or you know, fair weather Trekkies, the concept is that Data the Android from the Star Trek The Next Generation show has written a musical based on the events of The Wrath of Khan, which are historical events in his universe. And he's an android, so the show is clunky and funny where it doesn't mean to be and <laughs> steals from all these different musicals because he doesn't know how to write anything original. He's like synthesizing things from other shows. Um, it's fun. It's funny. It's still in development, but uh, the latest version of the script recently got a reading in Dallas. They put it up in about a week, so it's not polished. Um, some of the people cast in the roles are surprising choices, but if you want to get a feel for the show... Uh, it's free to watch. You can go to twitter.com slash UASTPM and uh, either the pinned tweet or one of the recent tweets has a link to the uh, to that reading. And I think I'm going to just try to remember to go ahead and put it in the pinned tweet. Um, but yeah, it's uh, if, if you're into Star Trek or you're into musical theater or especially if you're into both. Um, it's something fun to check out. And you know what? If you're not into either, you're the most valuable human being to me because (laughs) if you watch it and like it or don't like it, I need to know because I want this to be an off Broadway show. I'm literally doing things to nudge it that direction in the next year or two. And, um, Trekkies alone cannot make this show, uh, live in a cutthroat environment like the New York theater scene. So if you happen to watch it and have thoughts, especially if you're not familiar with either, that's good to know because what we want to do is have a show that survives on word of mouth. And the best thing I've ever heard is people going, I don't know anything about any of this. And I loved it. So yeah, take a look if you want, let me know what you think. And I will say that um, I've watched about the first half hour of that reading. I was actually supposed to be there live, and it just didn't work out. Which, um, um, for people who are kind of into musical theater but not uh, into Star Trek very much at all, that's that's kind of where I am. I, I like I said, I enjoy it when I come across it, but I don't really follow the latest shows. I've never seen there. There are some of the classics I've never seen before, like Cats and Rent and things like that. But um, I always enjoy it when I watch it. And I've, I'm about half an hour into Con, and I'm really enjoying it so far. I know enough of Star Trek lore just because it's such a big thing that the jokes land with me. And I would say not watching this because you are not a Star Trek fan would sort of like be not watching the 
the Book of Mormon because you're not a Mormon. <laughs> not not a one to one, but uh, you'll still get well, the jokes. <laughs> yeah. What 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 um what actually I found out later the reason that I was allowed. Well, the reason. Okay, I uh, I basically entered a contest that the winner would get their show performed as a live reading. That's why I got that reading of Khan. And the organizer told me that the moment she decided to go with Khan was when she asked in this kind of Shark Tank Zoom meeting pitch night where different teams pitch their shows. She was like, so what do you think about the fact that like this could be perceived as only being for Trekkies? And I was like, ah, so I'm on draft like five, like 5.0. And right around 3.0, I realized I have to stop writing a show for Trekkies and start writing a show for their dates. <laughs> um, and that has served me well. Um, and again, if people watch it, like, you know, just know that if you if you're watching, and you're like, I don't know what I've gotten myself into. Well, like, yeah, it's a it's a live reading of a musical about Star Trek by people that hadn't seen the script seven days earlier. It's a weird situation, but it's 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 pretty fun. It's pretty watchable. And and um like I said, first off, I appreciate you watching it. Um, it's what I'm hoping is that it's the kind of thing where someone can enjoy it on its own terms and just, in, you know, more or less understand enough about what's going on to follow the story and to have some laughs. And if they're a Trekkie and or a musical theater fan, well, bonus. You get all the, you know, you get all the jokes. Yep. I was still a little bummed I didn't get to make that reading because um, uh, I was hoping to meet you. It just didn't didn't work out. That wasn't a, a very, wouldn't have been a very conducive weekend. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, so there's always next time. There's a there's a guy supposedly in Fort Worth who might want to put it on in the next season. So who can say? Who can say? Who can say? Um, but yeah, so if you're uh, if you're ever back home and you want to grab a drink just to hit me up i um i know that your old stomping grounds are near my current stomping grounds so <laughs> um mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it links to all of this stuff that we can find will be in the show notes uh, once again brent just thank you so much for coming on and sharing a little bit of your um background and some of your own stuff with us of course it's been a blast and i um you know i know that uh you had you had to you had to do a little work to get me to to do the show. I don't do as many podcast spots as I used to, but I'm glad I did. I really appreciate the things that you two understand, and I'm sure your audience understands and appreciates that a lot of people don't. That is pretty amazing for me to experience, especially during a time when I'm really not steeped in this stuff as much as I was two, three, four plus years ago. So it's been a really nice trip down recent memory lane and um thanks for as eeyore says thanks for noticing me <laughs> you're very welcome it's been a pleasure and a privilege well i guess uh Shukapau, um we have gone uh, quite a long time on this episode because there's been so much good good content and because brent and i like to ramble so much um all, all of the usual stuff will be in the show notes uh of course everybody you can find us on twitter you can find us on discord you can find Shukapau at flat.io you can find us on youtube and um oh brent uh we've we've talked about where they can find your um the, the star trek Twitter. Uh, where can they find you on Twitter or on online? Oh my gosh. So, okay. So quick rundown. If you're interested in my Jackbox style game, more information about, about that is at useyourwords.lol. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Brentalfloss, B-R-E-N-T-A-L-F-L-O-S-S. -S. I'm also on YouTube as Brentalfloss. On Facebook, you can just search Brentalfloss. I think that's. I think we've covered all of the various <laughs> ways you can find and consume me. Nice. All right. <laughs> well, Shuka Pal, is there anything that uh, that I forgot? Um, I don't think so. Okay. Well, then once again, thanks, Brent, and I guess until next time, everyone, play very good games, be very good people, and keep listening to very good music. Somebody just sat down next to me, and I'm going to let her say hi. This is...
who, when she comes on the show, uh, calls herself Dusklight. She is also, sorry, my headphones are too big for your ears. <laughs> She's also a big fan, so I'm going to say hi, Dusk. Uh, hi. <laughs> uh, hi. How you doing? <laughs> I'm good. How are you? I'm all right. I'm, uh, it's Saturday night, and I'm talking to some nerds, having a great time. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And, of course, she's doing a lot of talking as usual. Yeah. Dusk is more talkative when, uh, when she joins us, but it's, we're listening to the Final Fantasy, uh, Overture theme. We just got a Brental Floss exclusive. Wow. Yeah, you'll get to hear it on the show. Cool. <laughs> all right. Go on back to mom. Okay. <laughs> We must save the crystals or orbs or the moon, whatever. <laughs> Shuka Pal, you know that, that this is going in the blooper reel, right? What? <laughs> I could tell I was totally picking up what you were singing just then. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Got that xylophone again. There you go. <laughs> mm-hmm. Cowbell? <laughs> Actually, not cowbell. Those are the sounds oh, of shovels hitting things. Oh, look at that. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah, We're going to talk about I'll, that I'll, when we come back. Yeah, I was going to say, I'll definitely <laughs> get into that here in a second. It was like between a cowbell and... Uh, uh, I want to say timbales. timbales. Is that there the, you go. There we yep, go. Yep, yeah, okay. Jinx. It's been a minute. <laughs> I don't know. You're you're getting me at my, uh, <laughs> um, I guess, most relaxed with this tonight. So <laughs> great. <laughs> That's that's the way to podcast tension. Not good for not good for podcasting. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but um, I kind of got I kind of lost my thread. You were talking about the intro, and um, yeah, yeah. Okay, and also um, we'll shoot shoot. I usually carry most of the show anyway. Sometimes when it's just shooting <laughs> me, we um, bless you. We <laughs> that's that's um, what I contribute. There you go. <laughs> we we talk a little. He talks a little <laughs> bit more, but usually when we have a guest, it's mostly me and the guest. So don't don't feel bad. Um, but uh, okay, yeah, All right. <clears throat> you wonder, says, if amounts of aims you can even pronounce when talking. <laughs> Do you know how long it took for me to find all those freaking names and slot them into the syllables? Jeezy, crazy. Because they're all real. Oh, yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah. I've actually I heard think, a few of them. I, I yeah, think I'm in the, I was going to say, I think in the video, I, you know, it's literally been ten and a half years since I put that video together. So, like, I'm not positive, but I, I'm pretty sure I went through and just, like, made lists of all of the ones I saw. And then tried to <laughs> slot them into the syllables. <laughs> Your headphones must be on really loud, shoot. <laughs> uh, all right, anyway, what were you saying? I could actually hear the music playing in your headphones through your headphone mic. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the ending, um, the way it works is um, I say – I think I put this in the chat earlier, but I um, – And keep um, listening to very good music. Yeah. There's your line. <laughs> All right, cool. Yeah, you that's got my this. line. It's like you've done this before. <laughs> <laughs> you've read a script before. Be there live. Uh-oh. I just didn't Did work out. Oh, uh-oh. Hold on. Fellas? Uh, uh-oh. Wait. So Hello? can you can you hear? Can you hold on? Oh hold my. on. Uh, well, I'm still rolling. Hello, hello. Is this a can hello? You, can you hear me now? Can you hear me? All okay, right. I'm gonna um, see hold if on. I Let can me talk. message you while being on a call. That would be weird. I've heard everything you've said, but you can't hear us. Okay, listen. 
I'm going to keep rolling. I'm going to hang up and call you back. Here goes. <laughs> 